All right, people. Welcome to this special episode of, I think I should call this one, Sultan's House of Sin. That used to be my, the, that used to be the show, the name of my show before Nuria came along. Um, but now, yeah, maybe, I don't know, like if, if, if I invite a religious person, they, they might not want to be a part of that. But anyway, they can turn that, they can go from House of Sin to House of Virtue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, so. you're 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 doing big things. It takes a lot of courage, I think, for ex-Muslims and uh, pe people who do Muslim content to focus on other religions and just out the gate. The reason why I think that's difficult isn't only because this isn't what they specialize or focus on, but a lot of the audience, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And so mm. what ends up happening is when you're uh, when you're going against islam which you could see a lot of harm in the world that you know currently right it's just one of those religions that needs reforming it really needs to become more progressive there needs to be an evolution that happens this is why people are like i don't think it can happen i just wish it would end but what ends up happening is other religions piggyback off of you and they love it so what happens is they come to your chat and they're like yes and then when you make a jab at another religion they're like I'll ignore that as long as you keep focusing only on Muslims and Islam and you don't, you know, don't jab at our special tradition because remember yeah. theirs is true and everyone else yeah. is wrong. Exactly. And this is, this is why at the end of the day, I'm an atheist. I have a worldview that is progressive, that is secular, that is liberal. Um, and it upsets a lot of people because ex-Muslim being an ex-Muslim was a, was a phenomena, but that novelty is going down. Um, so everyone was like, yes, this is what we wanted to say. But now, you know, the, the, the native informants are coming forward and now they're talking about it. So, yeah, we want to see it. And now we're, according to them, now they're hearing it from the horse's mouth, so mm -hmm. to speak. Now we're not hearing from a Christian apologist. We're hearing from ex-Muslims, people who used to believe in that. But then the moment they realize, and I think it's quite an observed phenomenon, maybe that is our own echo chamber that we think most people who leave Islam, they end up becoming atheists. But people mm -hmm. like David Wood and um, Christian Prince and all these other guys might disagree because uh, people who convert, who leave Islam and become Christians, they go to them. They don't come to us because they don't like our new worldview. Yeah. So maybe that could be the reason, but we, we actually don't have any uh, quantifiable data to, to measure that. But having said that, interesting that you raised that point because, and hence my poll, if anyone wants to... Um, uh, take part in that it says um, do you want me to start bringing other guests to demolish all religions 69% of the people have so far said yes destroy all religions but 29% have said no just focus on Islam so obviously it could have some Hindus as well and it could also right. have some Christians, Christians as well because obviously yeah. on my English channel I've got a fair few amount of Christians. So I want to diversify it. I, I I want, because as I said, at the end of the day, I am an atheist. So that's why I want to bring a lot of other people, not necessarily, well, well, again, I could be biased, but in, in my opinion, even atheists from all over the world, mm -hmm. <laughs> we kind of share similar values. We kind of maybe because we come to the same conclusions, that's why we tend to yeah. agree on a lot of other factors as well. Like, I mean, for example, if you if I ask you what's your opinion on LGBTQ, what's your opinion on abortion, more or less, we're probably going to be on the same on, on same. Yeah, I would, I would think that you and me would be more. Yeah, yeah. So, but this is the point. What I want to focus on, and we'll probably I'll, I'll respect the wishes of my audience unless it diversifies even more after I, I, my conversation with you. Um, Usually they say, well, Harris, you don't know what Christianity is all about, what Hinduism mm -hmm. is all about, so you just keep your mouth shut. You're ignorant. Okay. Yeah. If you think that's a fair enough point, let's just go by your logic. Okay, I'll keep my mouth shut. I wouldn't put forward, bring forward my own opinions. But you are an ex-Christian, uh, ex so to speak. So yeah. why would you have a problem with him? Why? Do, why, why? He can he can talk about it just like yeah. you. You can disagree me. with me then. You, at the end of the day, you can say, no, dear... By the way, no matter what I say, it's just like talking to uh, like fundamentalist Muslims. 
when you talk about Islam, they're going to say he never understood. It. He never really understood Islam. You never really got it, right? You no matter what, you were never really a true Muslim. Da 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 da. -da. I mean, no matter what, fundamentalist cannot apprehend the concept that someone can actually understand their religion and actually reject and know that this isn't true. Like, for example, our friend in the chat, the last Adam, Jesus is the only true God. Yes, everything else is wrong, right? Just kind of reaffirming my point up front. And I get it. I used to say these things. I used to believe these things. And I really, really would die on the hill. Like, it was just like, this is the truth. There is no way to the Father except to the Son. This is scripture in the Gospel of John. He talks about this and he says, and Jesus in the mouth of Jesus, which we'll get into. There's some really big problems with what did Jesus actually say? And to be honest with you, no one knows. I mean that. Like, we really are not sure of what Jesus actually said. Just like Muhammad. You go to the Hadith. What did Muhammad really say? No, we got to go to the Quran. Okay, okay. We go to the Quran. What did Muhammad really say? Are you certain that they didn't put words into his mouth between the time the prophet supposedly was walking around before he died and the time that they standardized the, mm -hmm. the, the Quran text? Because we have yeah. lower palimpsest manuscripts that show that there was a different version, even if it wasn't much different. There was something prior to the Quran we have that is a bit different. And how do we know they didn't put words in his mouth? Because they always put words in the hero's mouth over time. It's just the way it is. So mm. I think I do justice in bringing an equal scalpel. If we're doing surgery, I try to have an equal scalpel on things that I examine. Eventually, I will dive into Hinduism. Um, I think there'll be some wonderful mythology However, I think there's going to be probably some bad stuff too, just like we find in the Bible, just like we find in the Quran, you know, Abrahamic faiths and things like that. So I, I think you're on the right track of doing what you're doing, and it's good to get people who have been there. The only criticism I have gotten on Myth Vision is why aren't you bringing on current Muslims to present what they believe? And I'll tell you why I personally don't, and maybe you aren't, I don't know. When I've I was an apologist for Christianity. I know what they're going, I know their whole mission, their whole goal. If something was wrong or false, they're not looking, they're not, they're going to get around it. They're going to solve it. They're going to find any way to wiggle out of the problem. I'm interested in critical without apologetic material. I want to look at this like a naturalist. I want to look at this and go, what is the phenomena of belief? What is the phenomena of the literature at the time? Why are there many miracle stories, many gods and demigods and gods sleeping with women and their virgins even? Alexander the Great was born of a virgin priestess mother with the god Mars, okay? And he is born. The whole story goes that he's a, a descendant of a god, a son of God. What is Jesus? A son of God born of a virgin woman and notice it only shows up in matthew mark's our earliest gospel so the earliest account doesn't even tell you how he was born yeah it's matthew uh, so anyway i can ra you know i can ramble and go yeah wherever I, you want, I, but... I i i you know I, we, we'll definitely start with the uh, with the christian myths um and obviously your the name of your channel is myth vision so obviously this is something that is um because uh, no, no matter how You've gone through the journey. There are always some critical points um, <laughs> in your journey that everything, not everything, but a lot revolves around. So l l let's just move on from that point where uh, someone just, uh, I, I, I don't think that comment is there, but when I, when I scheduled this stream, um, someone said, and I'm assuming he was a Christian, he had a Western name, and he said, I don't understand what's Harris's problem with um is with um with christianity when it's islam that has threatened his life um okay be that as it may but did i actually when i when i left islam did i actually leave islam because of that reason that my life is going to be in danger or, or now that i talk about it 
then that would be spiteful of me to speak against it just because they want to kill me. Fair enough. That is something I have a right to be upset mm -hmm. about. But but that is not the reason. The reason why I talk about Islam is because A, I was a Muslim. B, it's not true in my observation, in my judgment. Um, so that's why I speak against it. So, But I also say that I'm an atheist. I don't find the surface level myths surrounding Christianity or Judaism or even Hinduism, I don't mm -hmm. find them impressive imp impressive at all. So I can talk about them. Or if you don't want me to talk about it, what's what's the harm in me inviting people who can talk about it? So so um so so I think I'm gonna be doing a lot more of that unless I get majority voters saying no stick to Islam, which I doubt. So guys please go there and hit the yes button. Um so I want to talk a little bit about you though, because there's yeah. a common there's a common perception that Westerners have buried their religion, their traditions, and their Christianity, and especially postmodernism, um, and the latter part of, or the second part of uh, after the World War II. That we see a different world, but America's slightly different, though. But especially in the European context, we see Christianity has been going downhill ever since. Um, if, if we set the, if we start from post second world war era, um, how, but, but when I've spoke, I've spoken with some American Christians and they say, no, the religion is so, or was so important in their lives that I once spoke with this guy not so long ago. And he said that one of his cousins turned out to be a lesbian and she left the house. She ran away from the house and he's. He was a Christian back then, so he didn't care. But now he's an apostate, and he actually covers his face. Mm -hmm. And he said uh, he's been trying to find her ever since. Um, so tell me a little bit about yourself, though. Were you, you said that you've gone through that journey. Were you a nominal Christian, or you actually delved deep into Christianity? You, you made a conscientious effort to understand the theology, and then you were like, tell us a little bit about your journey in about five minutes or so. Yeah, um, I'll try. Maybe I can make it quicker because I can bloviate. I can go on and on. Um, born in a military household. My father was a Green Beret in the Special Forces um, for 30 something years, retired Green Beret. My mother was, you know, stay at home mom most of my life. Uh, she was born in a Pentecostal house. Dad was Catholic. We never really were very religious growing up, uh, but mom would occasionally take us to church. She would bribe me with an all-you-can-eat buffet, and as a kid, I was like, I'm going. And I went. Didn't really care. My father was an alcoholic, so he'd come back from warlike situations and, and dangerous you know, trips and stuff and be gone for six to eight months, and then he'd be plastered drunk at the house, and we would deal with a lot of verbal and sometimes rarely physical abuse, but ultimately it was verbal abuse. So I'm growing up. Um, I'm always having to run away from home and I'm not talking about me, like my mom, my brother and my, my, uh, my, pretty much my family would have to leave. And my dad would get belligerent to the point he'd pull out guns, things like that. We didn't know whether he would be so blacked out. He wouldn't remember doing something. And he shot guns off in the house before things like that. So it was pretty intense. One time I had a gun pointed at my head because he had it at my mom's head. I stepped in front of it. And, you know, I had, I had just started at this time in my life to like, I'm a little kid going to a private school and at this, just giving you a point of my starting journey with Jesus, if you will, was I remember they were giving a sermon on lies and they really like, really, really get you to touch your emotions that they're trying to get you tap into psychologically your wrongdoings. So they want to create a problem so they can give you a solution for a problem. And so they told me, if you've lied, then you've lied about that lie. And then he like gave this analogy and had a visual of like a rubber band. And somehow I just remember rubber bands. I don't, I was a kid. It's like 13, 14 years old, something like that. Maybe I was younger than that. I'm talking about the defining moment that I really remember Jesus. Well, before this, I was going to church and I think I had experiences where I was feeling the music and, and the stories and things like that. But at this point, I turned my life over to Jesus, feel a warm, I mean, like a, a extremely warm sensation in my stomach. There's the crowd. I walk down to the altar. Here I am having this experience with Jesus. So I'm not afraid of dying, right? Because they keep telling you, like, you're not going to die. You're going to live forever. You're going to have salvation in Christ. So here's the gun pointed at my mom. I'm standing in front of it. No fear. 
but we leave the house. So I have a lot of trauma growing up with the abuse between my mother and my father. And in the story of Jesus isn't just about Jesus. It's about his father who is in heaven. It's about this idea that there's a perfect father. Anything you asked for, if you're his child, which I believed I was, anything you ask for, he'll give you. Will your father give you a stone if you ask for bread? Is one of the texts. So in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, I have a heavenly father who's perfect. My earthly father is fickle, is not perfect, has problems. So I started building this little relationship between me and Jesus and the father. And it's very weird because to know what is which and who I should pray to, all of these things were something as a young Christian, you're just, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Heavenly father. You're like, like going back and forth between the two of them, you, you know? Should I pray to the Holy Ghost? No, I don't see any precedence to pray to the Holy Ghost, but it's somehow part of the same thing. So it probably wouldn't hurt to. I don't know. You know, like never really thought to pray to the Holy Ghost. I was just supposed to be filled with the Holy Ghost. So the part of the domination I was in was a speaking in tongues type. This is starting. So they were more charismatic. And they said that looking at Paul, looking at uh, Acts of the Apostles, People who had the Holy Ghost would have the gifts of the Spirit. If you don't have the gifts of the Spirit, you don't have the Holy Ghost. There's evidence, they say, to prove that the Holy Spirit is in you. So when Christians walk around talking about, I'm a Christian, I'm a son of God, yada, 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 we would go, do you have the gifts of the Spirit? Because they're part and parcel of having the Holy Ghost. And what are the gifts of the Spirit? Speaking in tongues, prophecy, um, interpretation of these tongues. Of course, part of that is love as well, which I think a lot of people lack in Christianity. I'm not going to say some, there are some amazing people in all religions, including Christianity, but, um, but these are supposed to be the gifts. I go through years of this type of Christianity. I'm in high school carrying my Bible to lunch and kids are like, dude, wait till you're old and dying before you start getting into the Bible. I was very, very devout. I read the whole Bible. Um, when I was in 11th grade in high school, I, I got saved when I was in like eighth grade, but I read the whole Bible. I was a King James onlyist. So you'll know that I, I was part of a cult type Christianity. King James onlyist. We spoke in tongues. Um, evidence you had the Holy Spirit was gifts of the spirit. These were things that, that were in this. This is how it started. And I went from Genesis to Revelation. And I remember like being in the story. I was reading it and was so into it. Everything from when God created Adam to, you know, Moses and the Tower of Babel. And you, you can go all the way down to where you see Joshua in the conquest going into the promised land. And the judges and Samson with a jawbone of an ass killing a thousand men. And then you go on and you see the prophets and you see King Saul and then King David coming on and he's a warrior. And then all of a sudden you go to his son Solomon. And in the story, I was there. I saw it right while reading the Bible. Then you get down to the New Testament and it didn't feel the same. It felt like a different story. It didn't carry the same vibes as the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament that I was reading. So I think I took it pretty serious because most Christians don't even read the Bible, like actually read the whole Bible. And every moment I thought there were spirits and demons and I was having spiritual warfare and I'm living in this world where I'm fighting against evil. And I'm trying to fight against the flesh as well myself which is what they mean by the flesh so you're always at war with yourself if you take it serious and i'll just leave it at that because we can go into yeah you know it, it, it's it's already it's already put quite a lot of questions in my mind so there are some stark similarities between ex-muslims and ex-christians or people who become atheists or who go through this journey from from religion, through religion, away from religion, uh, ending up becoming non-believers. Um, and then there are some stark distinctions as well. And then on top of that, there are differences between the major social factors as well. Because, for example, if I had told this story in my Pakistani or Urdu and even in Hindi-speaking, uh, to my Hindi-speaking crowd, then and, and by and large, you might have seen that with Ali Dawes and all these guys who Muslims are not necessarily uh, confined it to confined to this particular uh, part of the society. They say, "Oh, trauma." 
yeah. instantly. But I notice this clear hypocrisy. I've always said that everyone goes through some sort of a mm -hmm. trauma. Everyone. I mean, I, I, I'd be lucky to see no one has gone through. I usually say that I've had a very lucky life. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like I've had some ups and downs in my romantic life as well. So, but I I, I don't think I've ever seen a, guy, a person who's never been through any type of trauma. Yes, the trauma, the, the, the magnitude of that could vary. But isn't there clear hypocrisy from these people? Just someone who might discredit you straight away. It's like, oh, okay, trauma, bad dad, whatever. That's why he turned away from God. But. Oh, no, that's not true. No, yeah, exactly. But but that's what. The, but isn't there clear hypocrisy in their worldview as well? That when some when when people go through trauma, and then they turn to God, mm -hmm. and then they somehow console themselves, find an imaginary trauma is not what made me leave. Trauma is not what made me leave. Yeah. I was more devout. I mean, you know how Paul brags. If you ever read the the epistles, Paul seven authentic epistles, you could read even the pseudo Pauline epistles. But nonetheless, you read Paul. Paul brags about being the most devout apostle, that he has done more than any of the others. In 1 Corinthians 15, when he lists off the appearances of who Jesus appeared to and whatnot, he says, and last of all, and a man untimely born, you know, I being chosen an apostle, I am what I am. But he says, but I've worked harder than all of them. And he brags about getting lashed three times with 39 whips and beaten by the Jews and like he brags about the trauma. The trauma in his life made him go deeper into Christ. Guess what? That's what happened to me, bro. Trauma didn't make me leave. Trauma made me drink the Kool-Aid even harder. I went so into Christianity, it was my identity. So when I went to leave eventually, and we'll get to that whenever you want, you know, we can get there. When I went to leave, I had existential crises. I didn't know what existence was. I might as well die. Like, what's the point of life if it's not true? And it scared me. So I was as, I went as deep as you can probably go, I suspect, other than actually being martyred. I mean, I felt like I'd ask myself, if someone asked me right now, if you believe in Jesus, had a gun to my head and that you couldn't renounce him right then to kill me, I would have been like, I can't deny my Lord and just die. Now, today I think about it. I'm like, dude, no, I don't believe in it. Like, like, do I need to believe in it? If someone had a sword to my throat in a warfare in the Middle East, let's say, and they said, convert or die, I'm converting because I'm a rational human being. I know that I can tiptoe and say whatever you need me to say, but at the end of the day, I still have my, my faculties. Like, I'm not, I'm not going to die over something silly like that. And I know that sounds ridiculous, but well, that's if a, I'm saying if a religion's that forceful, that, that's a problem too. But my point is, is back then it was Jesus or nothing. And yeah. I was as deep as you go. And all the people that talk crap, you go to and fro with the wind, like these doctrines, right? Because I changed a lot of my thinking as a Christian by studying. And we'll get into that even. We can talk about that. And they want to mock you. Christians are the worst enemies of Christians. Muslims are the worst enemy of Muslims. Hindus, I, I guarantee you, the biggest enemies within the camp are their own people. Of every cult in the world. Guaranteed. I'm seeing... You know, walks like a duck, talks like a duck. It does the same thing, and I'm, I've been seeing it all over. So when Muslim apologists act like, you don't know what you're talking about, bro, you're walking like that duck I've been looking at for years. you talking like that duck. You smell and look like the duck. Get out of here. You're a duck, dude. I know what you're doing. It, it, it's funny that all these religious apologists, and because, as I said, my problem is because ex-Muslim being a new phenomena, being novelty, and that attracts a lot of ex, a lot of Hindus and Christians and and they try or they have tried the new the new ones that are constantly coming and they're also always trying to tell me how they're different mm -hmm. from these other so-called cults um but but you're right we we look at them they make the same arguments they may in their minds they think that their theology is vastly different but it's not they're all built upon certain myths. And now so much so that these advanced apologetics have gone to a point where they say, well, myths are necessary. We don't even care about their truth value. You need to, when you set up a new civilization or any new, any civilization requires some sort of mythology behind that. And they go as far back as the Egyptians and the Sumerians and Greeks and Romans and all that. Like, you know, they had the Hercules and 
all those kind of mythologies, Apollos and whatever. And so if we call that, because I've started using the word Islamic mythology, because that is what it is, as you said early yeah. on, that I was actually thinking about it. There's so damning hadiths that Muslim scholars and muftis are forced to defend when all they could have done is just, they could have thrown them under the bus. Like, for example, Muhammad going to all his 11 wives in one night and yeah. having sex with them. You, we're both men, and let's say everyone, all the men who are listening, that ain't possible. <laughs> do I don't care how many Viagras you've got, that ain't possible. But they are forced to defend it because their clergy or, or, or the past scholars have declared it to be a Sahih Hadith. And that, if, if I ran into Muhammad, I was actually doing this thought experiment, like let's say there's a judgment day and we go to Muhammad and you go to Jesus or something, and then all these things that have been associated with it. I would say, and this Mufti is standing next to me, and I'm standing, and I say, sorry, Muhammad, you know, like I, I did, but I, I actually set you on a higher standard. I didn't think that you would be doing these kind of petty things, womanizing and all this kind of crap. Like you saw a hot woman, and then you saw her, and then you ran straight to one of your 11 wives, and you you told her, drop everything and let's have sex. This is a Sahih Hadith as well. Mm -hmm. I, I was saying that, A, it's not true. Either it's not true or it's fabricated. Oh, sorry, it, it, it's it's true and it is a filthy animal or it just can't be true. It's fabricated. That's the standard I'm setting you to. But this Mufti next to me who, who spent his entire life defending you actually was defending an indefensible act. So right. I, I would think that Muhammad would say, you know what, Harris, you know what? You Fair enough. <laughs> you, can, you can enter the heaven. Enter the heaven. But my uh, let's talk about similarities. Yeah. So we all have these myths. We have these people who defend these myths, whether they are Hindu myths, the flying monkey, flying horse from Islam. Uh, and and it's, it, you, you can see that in a Aboriginal myths, Native American myths, African myths. Right. You, you could see all of them. There's stark similarities. So straight away, they are defending something that has zero evidence, as a naturalist, as you say. We require a little bit more than that. In your case, what are, as I said, because your channel's name is Myth Vision, and mm -hmm. it seems like so, so we've covered a little bit of your journey. So it's Jesus or nothing. What about Jesus? So when, you, when you're trying to delve deep into it, what's something that you say, hang on a second, it doesn't make sense rationally, and then this is why they say, oh, no, no, faith, just have faith, and then everything else will make sense. I, and I guess critical thinkers, rationalists have a problem with that faith part because we can't force ourselves to believe in something that just doesn't make sense. So where did you get off the rail there? Where, where, there must have been yeah. a point. Faith or ask questions? How right. did that go? Okay, so first things first, I'm skipping many years of me going from a charismatic Christian to more like a Baptist Type oh, very, very quickly. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. It. There's some people there, and I think there's some uh -huh. Christian thinkers as well. Uh, we've got 125 people watching at the moment. So, guys, I will share the link uh, with 28 minute mark. <clears throat> we'll probably share the link in uh, at one hour mark, and then you'd be able to ask him, uh, ask Derek a question, not a debate, a question. No, I, I, um, I'm, I'm fine, even if they're critical or if they. What will end up happening is people typically who are Christians will have something to say, like. Like, how are you comparing Xerox copy of Islam and Christianity? They're not the same. I didn't say they're identical. And there are very many, there are many differences and there is a lot in common. So we can get there. We'll talk about, any, we'll take any of your questions, super chat your questions, and we will definitely get to them. Fairly confident someone's going to have something they want to say. So feel free to super chat. We, Remember, this helps Harris. So. Yeah, we, we, we have we have three super chat questions and then obviously we'll take um, some questions from people. None of our patrons have come through yet, so that's OK. We'll just take uh, our, our uh, listeners. So, yeah. So so where did it where did that clash begin and where you said, well, you know what? Sorry, I, it doesn't make sense. I just want to say, though, charismatic Christian speaking in tongues, that kind of stuff. King James only became kind of a Baptist uh, um, moving away from the more radical, nutty ish. Christianity uh, was trying to take the Bible more serious and was trying to say, okay, hold on, maybe these gifts ceased. Maybe. Maybe these stopped in the first century when the, the Bible was complete. 
So I started coming, getting away from that because it was just a wild Christianity. And then eventually studied my way, went to college, a Carolina Bible College. They changed it to Carolina College of Biblical Studies. Was going to go into seminary and become a pastor. And I was like devout, set on it, ready to become a pastor. Uh, while watching a pastor preach, I saw him misquote because he was just off memory, misquote a scripture that I knew verbatim. And I was like, hold on, man, what if I know as much as this guy does? Maybe I could be a pastor and teach people the Bible because I love it. And I went, became a Calvinist actually in the process by studying theology, systematic theology. We'll get into that if you ever have any questions. Point is, I became a, a, a Calvinist. I went into the PCA Presbyterian Church, which is a Reformed church. And then many years of being there, mind you, all this time I struggled with addiction on and off. That's a whole nother episode with you and me on how that impacted my development and what ended up causing me to leave. But what really did get me thinking was I had a friend who was an atheist. I didn't know he was an atheist, but he reached out to me and said, hey, I'd love to talk with you. And he says, would you be interested in hearing something if I showed you some stories that look similar to Bible stories, but they're not in the Bible? And I was like, sure, I'd love to hear some stories. And so he started to compare people like Hercules and he showed Hercules and showed me Jesus or Hercules and showed me Samson, the strongest man who ever lived in the Bible, the strongest man who ever lived in Greek mythology, Hercules. Hmm. And he started to talk about these commonalities. Now, why don't you believe Hercules? He'd ask me, but I don't want an answer from you, Derek. Let me show you another interesting comparison. So he starts to show me these little comparisons and then he mentioned that when you go far enough back in time, a lot of these ancient cultures lived off of what we call astrology. They observed the stars. Their, their calendars were based off the celestial signs, the sun, moon, and stars, things like that. And a lot of these stories, he said, are kind of hiding a message that they're actually about the sun, moon, and stars in many ways. Now, how accurate some of these interpretations are, that's up for grabs. But he used the Samson story as an example. And I'm like, okay. He said, the name Samson means little son. It means little son. So here you have, and I'm not talking about little son as in like, boy, a, the little bright the sun. Yeah. sun in the sky. Yes. <clears throat> he has seven locks of hair, dreadlocks, which represent the seven days of the week. And if you cut off his hair, he loses his strength. And Delilah wants to cut off his hair. She wants, to, she wants to take away his strength. And she's going to be paid in silver. Silver, op, um, in the ancient world, silver often represented the moon. The sun represented gold. So if you look at a lot of these things, you kind of have to know a little historical background on how a lot of these things could symbolically represent each other. Here's the moon who's in a love relationship with the sun but also wants to hurt the sun. And if you go back to ancient Egyptian mythology, this is exactly what happens with Ra and Set, okay? You, you have the god of the underworld and you have the god, which is the sun. They're in a battle. The god always gets buried and defeated, but rises again, okay? The resurrection. So you see this theme in agricultural mythology and you find this resurrection motif in the ancient world happening over and over and over. So Delilah's trying to get his strength. He says, no, 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 no. Uh, you got to tie me with a certain type of rope. He lies to the moon. And then the third time he's in so much love with the moon or Delilah, he finally tells her that the answer, you got to cut my hair off. And while he's asleep, it's nighttime. The sun is down below. If you take this interpretation, she cuts off his hair. Now he has no strength. It gets even further though. They gouge out his eye sockets, like sear out his eyeballs. In the story, you can take this literal and think this is a real literal man with literal story. Sure, it's written that way. However, I think it's a very cleverly devised myth because the sun loses its weakness when it enters the winter solstice. And in the winter solstice, darkness is on the earth. That's why it's the shortest days of the year. Darkness reigns where light doesn't. Then, one last time, Samson asks for strength. He's underneath a Dagon temple. He pushes the pillars and 3,000 plus Dagon worshiper cult members die that very day. He pretty much kills himself in the process, but destroys the Dagon temple, blah, blah, blah. Here's the story. And I said, that's clever. 
I've never heard of a story being told that way. And it actually made me enjoy the story even more. Because then I said, what else is there in the Bible that might have some astro astrological significance told in story form? Because if this is what we call a myth, I like myths. I like stories. But when people take these literally to the bank and they literally follow these things in modern times where we know a lot of this stuff is Bronze Age or very outdated Iron Age material, we don't live morally according to the things that are written in, in this text, then we should probably let that remain where it is and just enjoy the fascinating mythological stories. Once I saw these comparisons and saw that they were in Greek mythology, they were in other mythologies like the Mesopotamian mythology and stuff, I started to be on this journey of like, hold on, what if Jesus isn't the only one and the only way? What if God is bigger? And I came across a, a proverb. It was like a story parable. It's the six wise men of Hindustan. If you've read that, the blind men and the elephant. It's like the six wise men of Hindustan to learning much inclined. They all went to see the elephant, though all of them were blind, that each by observation might satisfy the mind. And it goes on that each man touches the elephant in a different body part and describes this elephant. Remember, they're blind. Describes this God, this elephant. It says, God is like a fan or the elephant is like a fan. And it's all poetic. It's a poem type thing. And then the next one comes and touches the tail. God is like this. And God is like that. And they all are arguing at the end of the poem, debating each other about what this elephant is like. And it's like pretty much saying they're all partly in the right, but all are in the wrong. And they all think they're right talking about this elephant. They have no clue. They've never seen. So I started believing God was bigger than the religions and was kind of teasing the cultures around the world by giving them little nuggets of here's my thigh. Here's my ear. You'll never know me until you're gone, till you're dead. You'll finally figure it out. You'll, you'll see me and then know and go, oh, I knew you all along. But I was becoming more broadened in my religion because I saw all of these stories. I really believe that if people study far and wide and actually open their mind and are willing to observe other traditions and cultures and religions, you'll realize how much they do have in common even when they're different. And when you do that, you go, what is this? Christians have an excuse for this. Justin Martyr did, the early one of the early uh, fathers. He said, well, the demons and the devils knew Jesus was coming, so they, they copied the religion. Huh, that's an interesting excuse to make yours true and everyone else is wrong. Why, why is yours true and everyone else is wrong? They say demons, just a martyr. What the heck? C.S. Lewis said, well, they're all mythologies, including Christianity, but Christianity is the true mythology, C.S. Lewis said. This is the true myth. So what happened is my, my consciousness expanded. I started to not be caught up in the bubble of Christianity only, and it really freed me. It really allowed me to not feel like this this God's watching my every move. Am I really his son? Have I been obedient? Am I really filled with his spirit? Why am I struggling with addiction? These things. So I didn't just Christianity or nothing. I went Christianity and kind of became somewhat of like a pantheist. Started to say God is in everything and everywhere. And it's beyond us. Every religion is beautifully trying to express it. But then I started to realize there's flaws. So I saw the human element and I started learning about science. I did not know about evolution. I did not really believe it. I thought the earth was 7,000 years old as a Christian. That bubble gets popped and it hurts real bad when you start discovering, well, we have some empirical testable facts that we can look at about our observable world. And they started to make an impact in the way I viewed religion itself. And I saw problems with the Bible because I still wanted to defend it and said it was astro theology and this amazing, clever story that God's trying to reveal. But then I realized there are many contradictions. There are many problems. And these are men that wrote this. And that I was scared for a while. I was afraid of like all the fear of hell for the, for the longest used to be over my head. This is the same thing Muslims experience. Jews don't really deal with this, but um, I, I had a lot of fear that what if I'm wrong, right? People want to try and use that. What if you're wrong? What if you're wrong? I kept studying, man. And then I saw, hold on. You mean to tell me 
that there was a hell before Christianity in other religions. So then I started to discover when you go into Zoroastrianism, the Persian religion, they had a hell. The Greeks had a Hades, which wasn't quite a hell, but there was a place where you kind of are like a wandering soul of torment, but there's no like cooking you, burning you forever and on and on. That is something that they find in Zoroastrianism, but like it cooks away the wickedness in a hot lava pit. But if you're a righteous person, it's like taking a warm bath of milk. So when I found out this stuff, I, it started to take away the power of this one thing. And man, myth saved my ass. Myth made me realize like, whoa, these are just really wonderful stories sometimes. And then sometimes bad stories, but stories nonetheless. And that is what I would say mythology is. Mythology are, it's myth is a story. And there's different definitions for mythology, but I'm looking at this as stories. The gospels are stories. Without a doubt. I mean, you know how confident Christian, I know I'm going to heaven. I know Jesus. I know it and I can show you. Are you ready to see the truth? You're not ready to see the truth, then don't ask. Because if you're not ready for this, you're not going to accept anything I say. And I wasn't ready for it at one point either. Because it was either Jesus or nothing. And nothing's not good. So that's not even an option. I got to have something. My plane landed, bro. I had to land the plane. I did not crash it, but I landed it. It was a slow deconversion. Well, I am. Um, I'm still stuck between similarities and distinctions. Um, and so far, all the distinctions that I'm observing are cultural, but similarities can be put into human behavior because at the end of the day, we're all humans and we all try to make sense out of things. And we just, as Christopher Hitchens said, that we need theories and then we can't come up with theories because we had conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. um, you, and it always fascinates me that people call atheists, free thinkers, arrogant and narcissistic and self-absorbed. But what you just said, if, if that is not... If that doesn't show our your humility, then I don't know what does. Because look at this. You're born into something. You're trying your best to understand it. Okay, we can even go by the fact that maybe we weren't ready. Maybe we don't have the cognitive faculties that are required to understand this, as they like to say. Maybe we're not. But, but we're trying, yeah? You, you don't, you mm -hmm. don't punish someone who can't and even well, I, I think the bible might say that too but i, I think i might have heard it in the movie or something but the quran says that god doesn't burden you with something that you can't carry so we're obviously we're burdened with something because we can't understand but then you're still not letting go of your god because now you're listening to that that, that samson story that that mm -hmm. was quite interesting and there's so many other parallels we can draw from you know, you would you would find a very similar mythology in Hinduism as well, maybe. And I, mm -hmm. I, I don't. I'm oh, not I an bet. expert of, Yeah, I'm not an expert because there's always this is a classic formula. Mm -hmm. You need a hero, you need a villain, and you need a, the the so-called fight between good and evil. Isn't that a classic old formula? And then we look at all these cultures; they all if came I, up with their own version. If yeah. I may, this is something that I think is important. There, we are pattern seeking creatures we are mm. pattern creatures we you know this from i know this now with certainty based on just looking at it from a scientific point of view but here's my point all mythologies are are embellished reflections of the nature and the world around us so in the ancient world they weren't writing biographies the way we do they weren't writing history the way they do they wrote stories and oftentimes they wouldn't even be reflective of the real reality of what happened but you know how you talk about you got a villain and you got a you got a hero? That is in real life. So like in real life, people have villains and people have heroes. It's the struggle of life. And one of the biggest questions humans have always had is, why do we die? Now, it wasn't what happens after you die. That's later. They didn't even have this problem about what are you going to, what's going to happen after you die. That's something that was later a thing we've developed after more philosophy, after more time to think about it. it the original mythology we have that goes back and is written, because before that, who knows, might have been oral. Oh, looking at the camera now. <laughs> the original mythologies were why do we die? And if you go back to the original 
Genesis, if you will, story, right? Here's a serpent, Adam and Eve, and the serpent's convincing Eve saying, listen, God knows that in the day you eat thereof, you will become like the gods. I'm, I'm just focusing on the story for a second. When they eat, their eyes were open and they knew they were naked. God comes and asks, where are you? I used to think this was like, well, God really knew where they were. Not anymore. I read this ancient text and it's just like other ancient texts where the gods really can't find the people. They don't know everything. That idea that God's all knowing, all loving, all loving and all powerful is when philosophy later in the Hellenistic period and beyond gets attached to your God. Your God did not know where Adam and Eve were. Your God is scratching his head going, oh, why did I flood all humans? I shouldn't have done that. Uh, like, like there are human traits that this God has. Just trust me and take my advice. Study more and more and more. And don't just stay in the bubble of apologetics. Trust me. You'll find stuff out. You'll, your mind will be blown. The story they are attacking in Genesis, they're, att they're attacking a story? They are jabbing at the Mesopotamian Babylonian myths. And they're showing why their God is better than theirs. You've got Marduk and you've got the Enuma Elish. You've got the Epic of Gilgamesh with the flood of Gilgamesh and stuff. The, the Genesis account is attacking that. And it's trying to explain why we die. Why are we mortal and not immortal? This is the question. And there's always a problem. And they're trying to give you a solution. And the way that Christianity ha handles that solution is to say, you know, we're all flawed because we all come from Adam, but Jesus will give you immortality. You know, he's going to reverse that thing that happened back there in that Genesis story. Just believe in him and you will live forever. Jesus even says, if you know, eat of my flesh, drink of my blood, and you'll live forever. He talks about it. You'll believe in me and you will never die. And even when uh, Martha or Mary it was, was crying over Lazarus' death, and he's like, uh, why are you weeping? Well, you know, uh, he's dead. And then she, he, she says to him, like, I know he'll be resurrected in the, in the last days or at the apocalypse or whatnot. And he says, I am the resurrection, Jesus says. So resurrection is a solution to the mythology of Genesis, of what's going on at the beginning. These are all reflections of real world. I have enemies in the real world. I have friends in the real world. I have love. I have hate. I have all of these attributes. They're just putting them into story forms. And this is how they wrote mythology. Even before they had writing, they told stories orally. And I'll give you one interesting observation I found out, Harris, that I thought was really cool. In the ancient world, when you didn't have writing, you connected things that didn't even connect. For example, every spring, we're, we're right now in what, almost summer now. We are in summer. Every spring from death in the winter, Life on earth would come. The grass starts to green. The birds and the bees. You've got pollen. You've got all these things happening. What we call, um, well, they call the birds and the bees sex and things like that. But it's the idea that fertility is here. And there was ancient fertility cults, you name it. They had a star because they observed the stars. And that star is called Venus or bright morning star. Okay. This star, when it would come up in the sky every year around springtime at this per perfect place. They believed that that star had the power of life. Notice they equate Jesus with the bright morning star. Lucifer was also equated to this, but that's a whole different mythology to get into. Um, but the bright and morning star brought life to earth. Now, <clears throat> you and I both know Venus, the planet, does not actually bring green grass and cause fertility on earth. However, they didn't know this. They saw that, why is it every time the star comes, fertility shows up? It has the power of life. So they connect dots that they don't have. It's kind of the God of the gaps in the ancient way of thinking. And there's endless examples like that when they didn't have writing <clears throat> because they didn't compartmentalize. They weren't able to test and observe and know Venus is not actually bringing the fertility here on Earth. There are other reasons we now know from science that cause these things. Um, and you could do that over and over and over, Harris. When you look at this stuff, you see the evolution. The gods were right there at the top of the mountains, right above the clouds. Mount Olympus, Mount Ebal, Mount Sinai, right, where Moses goes to get the, the tablets. <clears throat> Notice 
that they have Muhammad go on a mountain to get his revelation from Gabriel. Okay. It's a mountain where the people visit the gods because it's closer to the sky. They're just above the clouds. They're just right, right there, man. Just, just go a little higher. And even when they try to in the Tower of Babel, they're trying to get to the clouds to try and get to God, to try and fight shooting arrows at the God. That's not the only place, bro. And that's why it fell. Let me show you something. This book right here, Herodotus, the histories of Herodotus, right? This is 5th century BC, well before, you know, Jesus. In the fourth book in 46 or, or 94 to 96, when you read it, it talks about this God, Zalmoxis, and this particular community of people who only believed in one God. These aren't Jews. They believed in one God. They had wild traditions you can read about. It. It's really interesting. They believed in throwing a man up on the uh, on these spears. And if he survives, then the messenger is a bad person. But if he dies, that's a good thing. He's sent off. It's a human sacrifice method. But they're shooting arrows at the sky trying to hit the god what i mean like what's going on dude Th this is not a playbook from the hebrew bible it's a common mythological trope and it's not only that it's mythology and when i say mythology stories you might think that yeah. you think nothing's there no they believed in a lot of this stuff so they would practice <laughs> stuff like this weird superstitious things that we today would think are strange and there are cults today that still do stuff like that. And you go, man, you're really, really primitive in the way that you act. They're probably advanced in the way that the cults were around the time they started. We're, yeah. we're learning. We got to keep learning. I got to gotta make a couple of points there. What I just learned, what I heard from you. So uh, what I was saying about humility, that it seems that your journey seems it, 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 it is screaming out humility because, okay, you we looked at it, it didn't make sense, then you went up a little bit, and then you said, okay, you kind of became a pantheist. I thought that I was, an, right. I, I went through the phase when I thought that I'm an agnostic, maybe I'm not going to rule out God. And then obviously, as my as my knowledge of the world increased and science helped a lot, the, the, mm -hmm. the vastness of the universe always scared me, but at the same time, it scared me because I didn't understand it. Well, I still don't understand. I think nobody understands, but but just a tiny bit of it because you understand it incorrectly. Whatever you understand, you understand mm -hmm. it incorrectly because seven heavens, seven sky, God is on top of it. There's a throne about Get out of here. Okay, I don't have time yeah. for this. So, so that's not true. Okay, now it makes sense how galaxy is so big. Andromeda is the closest galaxy away, which is so many, 2.5 <laughs> million light years away. Okay, now, now I'm like making sense. Carl Sagan's quote was very powerful um, uh, about, no, 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 our prophets say, no, 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 our universe is small. We want to keep <clears> it small because... Uh, so so then you go one step further and then it's a step-by-step. Step. Is that not the journey that every all these religious people talk about that we have taken and then we've come to a conclusion? And, but the other point that I wanted to make is that you said that, I mean, myths and look, just the stories itself and then and the way you go in these details it kind of shows that how interested you are but for me i was actually never really that interested in the in the in the stories aspect and i understand a lot of people say the stories are important we look into it sometimes you know you need um you know you need to be analogous in yeah. the, in, in in the depiction of the reality might be too hardcore for you create analogies and parables and then you go with it. I I, I get that. And it, it, it appeals to some people. Maybe this is a reason why we like fiction, Lord of the Rings and fantasy yeah. movies and all that. Maybe we like all of that. But to me, or, or maybe that's the case with a lot of other people as well, that is not really that impressive because when I want to understand the universe, when I want to understand the harsh realities of our life, of our lives, then I want to know hard hitting facts, mm -hmm. not just stories. Um, you know, David versus Goliath. Okay, good versus evil. No, sorry, I don't need that. You know, your enemy can be big and strong. I get that. Maybe when I was a kid, fair enough. But now I want, I, I, I want to see why Ukrainians would win against um, against the Russians. Yes, I right. see the value of boosting the morale of your uh, uh, of your soldiers and saying that you know the enemy might be big and strong. They might have more tanks, but you know we've got the truth on our side and. In, I get all of that, but at the end of the day, you still need those those uh, what were the javelins? You you need the drones. You need that, otherwise you're not going to win. Yeah. So you go through that, and then you still value it. Does that? Do you think? To me, 
I would say that, well, if God is trying to communicate with the vast majority or, 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 of, uh, of the planet, then shouldn't he have equated, shouldn't, that, shouldn't he have left something for everyone? Because Muslims say, well, Christians, a lot of Christians say that, well, Islam just copied these stories from the Bibles. Mm -hmm. um, then you're, what you're telling me, a lot of these stories are copied from, obviously, Epic of Gilgamesh and Enumeration and yeah, the, there's... this Greek mythology. So they obviously did it from their preceding cultures. Right. It makes sense. Of course, they were not going to talk about Genghis Khan who's going to come 1,500 years later. So they did that. And they needed stories to tell, to, to tell us about the harsh realities of life and whatever. Don't you think that that is also tr problematic? And how do Christians defend that part? They, they say, oh, Islam, copy, paste, Xerox. What uh, about uh, them? How do, how do they answer that? Well, okay, let me let me rephrase it in a question to you, okay? Um, what is the earliest uh, religion in the world, according to Muslims? Well, they say polytheism, but they also go, uh, well, no, they go with they go with Islam. They, they actually, yeah, it's, yeah. It's actually Adam was a Muslim. Islam. Adam, Adam was a Muslim, okay. yes. So, so here's what Christianity does. You ready for this? It's the bait and switch trick. It's it's happened to every religion. Um those religions, uh, Derek, you don't know what you're talking about. The Epic of Gilgamesh copied the Bible. The oldest uh, flood myth is Genesis. Are you kidding me? Uh, Noah's the oldest story of a uh, flood. Really? So the Mesopotamian, yeah. it's so factually incorrect, it's not even funny. So it's the same. No, they copied Christianity. They copied the Bible. The Bible is the oldest. It, look, even um, a lot of uh, fundamentalist Jewish people that I have in my group think the oldest language on planet Earth was Hebrew. It's Hebrew, yeah. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I bet you if you did this to Islam, they'd say Arabic. I mean, like, like everybody has their right and everyone's wrong. When will yeah, everybody Adam, Adam figure did speak out? Arabic. I uh, think Adam did speak Arabic according to Islamic mythology. <laughs> <laughs> Don't quote me on that. But me. If Doesn't someone can tell me, me yeah, it, 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 I think I've heard it, but I, I, I can't scripturally verify that. But I, I, I think because in the Quran, oh, actually, yeah, he did speak Arabic because um, in, in the Quran, there's a whole conversation between Allah and Adam, and that's in mm -hmm. Arabic. <laughs> so yeah, so, you, so yeah, so you're forced with it, yeah, yeah, uh, and and it's such a classic circular argument, yeah. So I mean, they copied that, and uh, where did they copy? They copied from us. Well, no, this is on, why see. Justin Martyr, when he got caught, what happened is pagans are pointing out, look, your Jesus looks a lot like our pagan heroes, Hercules and Apollo, and why is there so much in common? And he says that's because the demons and devils knew Jesus was coming, created these myths to look like him, but this one's true. This is exactly what C.S. Lewis did. Now, another apologist father tried to argue and use that to his advantage to convert pagans. Look, mm. we, we follow you know, Jesus no differently than you do your myths of Apollo and Hercules and like, you know, the name of other gods, they used it to get pagans to come in. Can you imagine approaching Muslims and not and trying to get them to come to your position, but not using something that walks like a duck and at least talks like a duck. You got to have something similar in order for them to walk across that bridge. Or the odds are you're not coming. Why do you think many ex-Muslims became Christian? If there was, if they were so different, I mean, completely, Muslims wouldn't just jump into Christianity. I'm telling you, this is a mother religion to Islam. It is. There's a lot. There's a lot here to look into. Um, I don't even remember the question anymore now. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, if, if, yeah, I, I think you can't answer that, um, that, that how Christians justify the fact. But I think, um, no, it, it makes sense. But I think we need to, exactly, we're at one hour mark. Um, mm -hmm. there, there's so much I want to ask you. Because um, I'm actually, because people love to say, this is all, oh, this is false equivalence. You don't know this, you don't know that. But yeah. the more I look into it, there are some, undeniable similarities between the behavior and the understanding yes the stories vary a little bit and 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 exactly how you said it, 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 that pay that these pagans said that hey your character sounds like a 
there was a character called Nadir ibn Harith, and there's a verse in the Quran for him as well, not mentioned by name, but we see that in the, in the biography. He said, hey, Muhammad, dude, you're telling us the same stories that I've already heard, and I can tell those stories better than you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Muhammad wasn't, a, he, he didn't have power at that point. So, but, but then at the Battle of Badr, I think when he, when he got a hold of him, he had him yeah. killed. He actually gave specific orders and get this guy because he's on to me. Um, so we're going to, I'm going to share the link if you're okay, okay. with that. Yeah. Okay, we're yeah. exactly one hour mark. Um, so guys, there's a link there. I would prefer if uh, any of you guys, especially from Christian background, I see Adam was there. He was making a lot of points. The last Adam so making these absolute statement, Adam, I'm sorry. Jesus, Jesus God, is God. Say, Muhammad is the last messenger of Allah. You can you can mm -hmm. say that all of these things, they don't really matter. We need to stick to the um actually I think he made another point as well. Let me share that. Um so so you know, we have also gotten really good at making sexy statements. For example, here in Revelation here saying that you can't disprove miracles. Mm -hmm. But as Christopher Hitchens said, that what can be asserted without evidence can be thrown away without any right. further evidence. Right. Uh, so it, it, it doesn't matter that and that is a rule. Of the world what is it that in our day-to-day -day lives that we actually design our whole worldview or our, our whole existence that can't be supported by evidence you want to go to work why you you know this your hey, boss doesn't like you you know you you have little bits and pieces of evidence then you believe in it, and then you make a decision and that's how you formulate your life um but th there's nothing else that we leave it to faith or chance we we, we don't unless you're a gambler of course then uh the, and you know we all know how that ends <laughs> you know wins. even when i would when we make that little common was colloquial saying of like uh, i'm taking a leap of faith here you know i'll say that like like i'm moving right if i'm moving my i'm moving to a new location and it's new and it, i don't know what it is i'll say you know, I'm taking a leap of faith, but really in reality, when I'm saying that I'm saying like, I had, I trusted my faculties, my capabilities that the only thing I mean by that is, well, it's a little bit unknown. What's going to be, what's going to be, mm. doesn't mean I'm taking the leap of like, Oh my gosh, my whole soul and life is resting on this. I'll just say, Hey, yeah, I'm taking this leap of faith. And wh when I use it, I mean it like it's kind of a bit unknown. And the definition of faith being used within the new Testament is a whole nother subject, a can of worms to open because I've dealt with the apologists like, uh, my good friend, um, Michael Jones, he's a big, uh, Christian apologist. He's got the, uh, YouTube channel. What is this uh, YouTube channel called? I don't know why I can't think of his YouTube channel name, big, big YouTube channel. If you're a Christian, you probably watch Michael Jones. Um, but like he defends this idea that faith is like this thing based off some facts, like you know. Read Hebrews 11 in the New Testament. It's not. Like there was no chance and no evidence pointing to the fact that anything in real world was going to be the way that they said that the promises that God was going to say were going to happen. But they believed that God would do it. And guess what? It ends up happening. Sarah's 99 and she's giving birth. And they're like laughing, going, uh, which is the reason why they named their son was named in Hebrew. The name uh, is it Isaac? Um, no, not Isaac. Uh, I'm trying to think of the name. Could be. Yeah, maybe it is Isaac. Laughter. Uh, Sarah's oh. first son is Isaac, which this I think gets into the whole Ishmael um, and Isaac scenario. But Ishmael is I I Ishmael is Isaac, and um, what's the other brother's name? Is Hark. Oh, no, hang on. I no, Ishmael and Isaac are the two. In Islam, it's Ishmael that goes and is the promised son. Yeah. Isaac is the promised son. Ishaq. Yeah. Ishaq is Isaac. Yeah. And, and that's where that's where they differ. And, and what a pathetic difference to have. <laughs> you know, yeah. like a Muhammad is from him. And then, no, that was from the other one. Um, okay. So, guys, yes. Uh, somebody asked, Jojo asked. Yes, I've shared the link. Guys, I would prefer to have civil friendly conversations. Oh, yeah, of course. Let's know. do it. In case someone's <laughs> thinking that I'm like here to... No, dude. I, my mom's a Christian. Let's make it really uh, simple. Like, my mom wants to convert me. And <laughs> and I'm like, I love him, Mama. I, yeah. I, I want the last Adam to come and have a chat. I mean, just just have a little conversation. Just have... You don't even have to show your camera. You know? No, you don't have to. Uh, there's some questions here. So, Trinity, okay. But in John 16, from 12 to 16, when you read it, it sounds like the Jesus is claiming to be a God. Please answer. I agree. Ooh, I like that. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John is the latest gospel. The Gospel of John has Jesus as a pre-existent logos. The Gospel of John has Jesus do seven miraculous signs with the I am statements, the similar I am statements we hear Yahweh say in the Hebrew Bible. So in John, he is 100% claiming divinity, like, like in this world divinity, that he is like kind of a um theosophy if you will he, he is god in the flesh in john it says the that god became flesh it literally says this in john chapter one so i 100 percent agree with aziz great question thank you for the super chat please super, everybody super chat questions i'm even the hard questions feel free to ask just showing support for harris if you disagree with me i don't want that to be a punishment <laughs> well, yeah, look, I'm just saying, like, help a friend out, help Harris out, because, you know, at the end of the day, you can disagree with him on the subject of Christianity, even if he's not a Christian, and you know that. But, like, you can still support him on his work that he does with Muslims and the way he deals with Islam and other things. So show love, show that Christian love that you guys, you Thank know, you. are all about. Thank you, Derek. Yeah. Uh, this next question is from Zagro, since he's in the chat as well. And I've got a couple of Pakistani Christians with us as well. So we're going to take you next. Zagros, you said, Haris Bhai, Derek Bhai, Bhai means brother. I humbly present to you my jizya in utter humiliation. <laughs> jizya in non-Muslim text. So, Finally um, a face that matches the name. What's up, man? <laughs> good, good. How are you? Good, good. So, Derek, I have two questions for you uh, with regards to Christianity and Haris Bhai. Uh, I have a question about Islam, but if it's not the topic of the day, we can skip that. Let's just focus on Derek for today. Sure. So, Derek, I go to ASU, the Arizona State University in uh, Tempe. Uh, it's a very large school for those who don't know. It's one of the largest in the U.S. actually. And there are uh, a lot of Christian groups, uh, like a tremendous number of those. And they are not shy at all to invite people you know, to their gatherings and their churches, etc. And occasionally I do accept because, you know, you can only learn so much from uh, YouTube. So I do go and, you know, to their churches, to their meetings and, you know, have conversations with Christians. And I've been going to this particular group for a while, made some friends. We were talking about um, God and why he um, so desperately wants our worship, so desperately wants people to follow him and his rules and, you know, not other gods, etc. And, um, I pushed back a lot, but at some point, um, my Christian friend told me, well, God is jealous. I said, what do you mean? Like, are you being sarcastic? What do you mean by jealous? He said, he is jealous. He wants, uh, everything, all the worship to be dedicated to him. As an ex-Christian, have you ever heard from a Christian something like that about God being jealous? Um, well, Christians say it often. So when I was within Christianity, this is stuff they would say, God is a jealous God. It's not okay that you're jealous. It's not okay that I'm jealous. But God is above. It's that euthyphro argument, you know, is it's the idea of like, do, is are things good because God says they're good or are they good uh outside of God saying that they're good, this whole, whole idea, but God is jealous. Christians teach this, not all maybe, but most from what I understand that are within Christendom, uh, within orthodoxy would admit, yeah, God is jealous and wants your, wants your undevoted attention, wants your worship, wants your everything. Um, I don't hear that being an argument often from apologist to non-believers but maybe you have gotten so friendly with them that they feel very comfortable saying that to you. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, oh, God's jealous. He, he really wants you to look at this scripture. He really wants you to come in. It's almost like if you're a Muslim trying to convince people to come to Islam, but Muslim to Muslim, you know certain non-believers just have a certain idea about things. You're probably not going to speak the way you do to a brother in the faith. And uh, I think that... Uh, if you ask them, they'll just say, yeah, that's what the text says. But you must know it already. You see what I'm saying? Like, it's not something they, they approach you on the street to convince you if they're doing apologetics to try and go, listen, you need to come in because God is jealous of you. Not coming to him. That doesn't help their argument, you know. 
My God is jealous that you're not coming to worship him. So come and worship him so he's not jealous of it anymore. Like, no, that doesn't. Derek, that jealousy part, is it actually in the Bible? Like, can it be substantiated? Yeah, I can find the passage right now. Interesting. Yeah, you didn't know that. Oh, yeah, I did not know that. But indeed, as you said, we we actually became good friends with uh, some of them, actually, most of the church. But, uh, yeah. So, uh, I have, uh, yeah. Exodus thirty four fourteen, for example, for thou shalt worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous god. Um, Exodus thirty four, and then Deuteronomy six fifteen, for the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee and destroy thee from off the face of the earth. King James version. So, for those of you who are King James only, you can't say it ain't the word of God. Hallelujah. That's interesting. Uh, I have one more question and then I, I'll leave. Um, with regards to the Trinity and... Zagos, we'll you know, take it next time. Zagos, can we take it next time? It's really offer? quick. Cool. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so logically and mathematically speaking, if A equals uh, Z and B equals Z and C equals Z, it must necessarily follow that therefore A equals B equals C. But when it comes to the Christianity, you know, the Holy Spirit, the Son, whatever, uh, all of them being, you know, part of God and whatnot, part of the Trinity, but uh, in themselves being um, in some way distinct. Um, I see that as a logical inconsistency, and I wanted to hear uh, what you had, what you have to say about that. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I I 100% agree that there's a logical inconsistency here. However, what they'll argue is God is beyond our comprehension. And Mm. so being God is beyond your comprehension. It's like saying, you you know, you can't touch it. You can't uh, you can't debunk it. You can't prove it's like the earlier uh, statement. You can't disprove miracles. Well, I can't prove them either. You can't prove them either. Like, so if you can't prove them, how are you going to? disprove them and all we have is our mental faculties to try and make sense of things but if god is above our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts and as far as the what is it uh, the hebrew bible that says that his thoughts are as far they're beyond our comprehension you can't even grasp islam has the same concept about their god allah yeah. you know that you just can't even fathom it well if it's incomprehensible then coming up with an incomprehensible doctrine like the Trinity that you're trying to make sense of, I guess you could say that's okay. You can be okay with a complete issue. You know, you don't know. So if you don't know and you can't really, it's a blind men in the elephant thing, they believe it anyway. But mind you, the Trinity, this Trinity teaching, I understand that they trying to say this is in the text, this is in the New Testament. And there is a passage that was interpolated later uh, there are three who bear record in heaven. I think it's first John can't remember what passage exactly, but, uh, this is a development, a theological development centuries later. This is not originally in the text. I have a Christian look, I've got a list Harris of like 50 academics I've interviewed on my channel. I don't just pull stuff out of my butt. I'm not just making this up. These are like high end PhD skilled scholars that I interview And I have some that are actually Christians, but they're academics. And they say, like, look, my faith is this, but these are the facts. And they admit Paul was not a Trinitarian, that Paul did not believe that Jesus was equal with the Father in any any way. So there's no there's no way to try and make this reconciled. He admits this, but then he goes, but I do go to a Trinitarian church. It's kind of like uh, it's kind of like Francis Moore. Uh, He says you know the evolution is true um but when he i used to be an atheist but then when he saw this frozen beautiful frozen stream or waterfall and he thought that this must be god and then now i believe in god but the the guy is a genius in his own uh in his own discipline he decoded human genome um yeah it's quite it, it I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't consider these people idiots, obviously. Like, no. I, but, but it's just so fascinating that how people can believe in something. I think maybe this is why it is so difficult for these, for a lot of people. They say, well, or they think that because it can't be disproven, therefore I'm gonna hold on to something that is so dear to me. Yeah. 
All right, Zagros, thank you very much. Thank you, Zagros. Uh, thank you, brother. I'll uh, I'll, I'll take a uh, couple other guys. Uh, guys, um, I, I see some, some people have been banned who are quite regulars. Dinu Batsha is one of – he's actually my video editor. I think someone blocked him. So please don't block him. I don't know why he's not. I didn't. I never added him as a moderator. So he 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 edits our videos. So guys, he's he, he's the guy. He's my guy. And then there's another one confirmed. Janati, that that guy. I don't know. He he said Jesus is gay. I think so. Maybe John didn't like that. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, those those of you who know me, I'm a bit of a mild. You know <laughs> that that works. It's okay. Um, okay. So we'll take Masi after this. And Masi means. Christian, um, it's an Urdu word. It's an Urdu translation of Christian, and and he calls himself Christian Muslim. So that's quite interesting. But anyway, we'll we'll take him next. The last item is saying all the best. God bless you. Most Christians are not. Now I can't remember in what context or to what reference is he saying most Christians are not. Um, but we'll thank you for your super chat. The last item. I'd love you to, to come to the show and maybe you know ask. Derek, a question or two. Hey, Derek, love from an Indian ex-Christian atheist. How do you know, how do you see the growth of Christianity in vast parts of the global South? Many of them in places like China or Iran risk even death to remain Christian. Mm -hmm. How do you, how do you see that? Yeah. Uh, the, the, like below us, right. Is South America. And the, like, there are Christians that have left and can't say, you know, when people think that, uh, only Islam, you know, kills apostates and stuff or like persecutes them and whatnot, wants them dead. It, that is not only Islam. I have friends in South America who are terrified and cannot go public about leaving Christianity in the South or South America. As far as the growth, how how do you see the growth of Christianity in vast parts of the global South? Many of them places like China or Iran. Was, I mean, look, um, I thought I would be willing to be persecuted. And as, as intense as I was in my mind of Christianity, I interpreted any type of backlash because I was such a nutter. I mean, I was so in uh, my mind about Christianity. I was getting persecuted, I felt, often. In the early church, when you see martyrdoms happen, this may not always be the case, but I have scholar coming on later this month, the myth of persecution, in fact, by Candida Moss. And she, she's going to point out how stories of martyrdom, not even true, but as far as real stuff that's happening in China, um, that they can't even read their Bible. Can you imagine being a faith if you've ever been in one? And you love your faith. You're going to try and get a Bible or a holy book or whatever to try and read it. Or if you're a Muslim, you're going to want a Quran or whatever. Imagine you can't and you get persecuted because you're trying to privately worship. You have a, a secret place you're trying to do this because you can't legally do it out in the open. I mean, that sucks. I don't really know how to say, I mean, other than the growth of it might be pushed because you're supposed to be martyred. So they're thinking it's even truer. Well, if we're being persecuted for his name's sake, they said that in the text. It's validating our faith even more that this is true. If we're being abused because of our religious beliefs, it just proves the message of Jesus to them even more. So it's almost like uh, a lot of people would say that in Judaism, there's this kind of complex of like they want to be martyrs. They want to be you know, in a tough spot. Uh, constantly putting themselves in a dangerous place for the rest of the world to persecute them and stuff. Um, and then they still believe in their God. But in the ancient world, that wasn't how things work. You know, you, your God gets beat when you get beat. And if you get beat, you're supposed to follow the people who beat you's God. Monotheism changed that. So I don't really know how to answer this question other than my thoughts are, I feel bad for them. I wish they had yeah. religious freedom, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, yeah. I, I think that was a point. Uh, I, I don't, I don't know what he meant by global south. I think any the, the global south usually means the southern part of Africa, Australia, New Zealand, and South America. Maybe um, you did make a good point that in South America, and I, South America is the most neglected part of the world. Um, we talk about Asia, Africa, um, and obviously Europe and Americas, but we we never oh, sorry North America we never talk about South America because South America is probably one of the last strongholds of Christianity. Mm -hmm. I don't think that there is any 
correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that there's a that there is a state persecution, but there there would be biases, as you mentioned, that if you are a Christian or member of LGBTQ, they would be worried to come out, and yeah. uh, you know, and and then people could take matters into their own hands, and then it could get worse. It's not it's not um, very open yet, it's, but again, that just shows the societies that haven't really progressed as much tend to have these kind of behaviors. Um, unless, of course, it's China, where the, which is a totally different type of worldview, that's totally totalitarian and Iran. Um, I, I've heard about some persecution of, um, of um, um, Christians in China mm-hmm. and uh, in, in Iran, but yeah, we, we haven't, yeah, I, I don't know if it's on, on a scale that has, you know, gathered world's attention. Um, but in your worldview, obviously, because you're a liberal atheist, and obviously, you don't support any of that. Just just to get it on the on, record. On yeah, the no, I I think they just these have Christians right to... should have the right. Mm. If 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 let's say China has more of a, let's say they were trying to come at this atheistically, they're not doing it right. I'll tell you why. By them actually doing this, they're affirming and deepening these people's faith even more. So if their goal was to try and get people to, let's say, worship the state, let's just say, as some people would say, um, mm. they're not going about it the right way. Yeah. If you want to have the sword to someone's throat and you want to convert them, that's an option. But you can't pretend that's the right way to do things. And I think they deserve religious freedom like anyone else. I wish the whole world allowed people to have religious freedom and that we, including these religions that say you shouldn't have it, I think they should change that as well. I think they should allow everyone the option to be able to believe what they want to believe. But at the end of the day, I have faith (laughs) in humanity to continue in our progression the way we are from the sciences we learn and what is observably better. That is something that I think we're noticing is that what works and what is actually observably better is what we're trying to do. We're trying. Now we're heading in a better direction. It's this way of thinking has abolish slavery, not their way of thinking. Right. And that's a clear evidence of that. Uh, Battlers has asked another question. One more question. How does the general loss of faith in God makes a difference in, persist- in the persistence of Christianity? Hang on, I don't get it. Hang on. So when you lose your faith in God, how does that make you make a difference? Oh, oh so it, it, oh, okay. So I think if you are Firm on your belief in Christianity. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It doesn't make sense. South America is also very European in orientation, yet Christianity is booming there. I I, I don't understand the first part, but I think the second part. Yeah. So I, I think that's probably requires a nuance in that that um, North and South Americans are both former colonies of European nations. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, so how come the North went in a different direction, more secular and liberal direction, as opposed to southern americas i mean Um, you just go back to the constitution you look at what we had as founding fathers being mostly deist and we became more of a liberal secular country i mean yeah sure puritans who came over here were highly religious people other people who were here that were settlers highly religious people but when you do look at our constitution and our first presidents and whatnot you find many deists that Mm. thomas jefferson look what he did with the bible for example he cut out the miracles he kept some of the morals and teachings and stuff so my point is in south america i doubt their leadership was heading in this and they're looking at a democracy in the same way where religious freedom outweighs anything you can believe in anything you could stand in you could stand imagine i always think this is a shocker when i see satanists walk into a capitol building and start preaching satanism and you think this is a Christian nation. And there are Christians that are screaming, crying, literally trying to argue and fight the demons in the air against these Satanists in the Capitol building. I've watched documentaries on this. They lose their mind because they don't. But that's where it guys. leads, yeah. That's what it leads to, yeah. Once you start believing in myths that are not supporting, then it's an f- open world. You can believe right. in anything. Yeah. And I mean, so you should have the right to. The problem is, like you said, you, European settlers in South America from Spain onward, if you will, but Catholicism is like the number one religion as far as Christianity goes in South America. They venerate the mother, Mary, 
like mm-hmm. a, a ton. And they even have a matriarchal system a lot in their households. I wonder if that came with, with the Spaniards. Um, but they're backwards in a lot of their thinking. They're behind. So, yes, yeah. I, I just think that eventually, as a lot of these, what I'm doing, I have people who watch my channel, who speak Spanish, who translate some of this stuff and want to get it into their area, but they don't want to be known because they're afraid of the persecution. That wow. Get. Yeah. It, it, it's quite something, isn't it? <laughs> it's um, we because because we actually kind of make this claim that it's only and, and I'm, I'm sure Islam or, or the Muslim society at large is probably a bit more hostile in defense of their religion. But then, as you said, South American Christianity might not be that far off. But I think the only difference is, and we talk about like once it's state sponsored, when you have blasphemy and anti apostasy laws, then it goes the next level. Then it's the state that's hunting you down. So Mm -hmm. that might not be the case in in Colombia or Argentina or Brazil, but people themselves might be a bit um, dogmatic and a bit more conservative or hostile when it comes to defending their faith. Right. Uh, okay, let's just take one call. Masih Muslim, sorry, I really have to go very um, go through these calls very quickly. Masih, can you just quickly just ask a question, not a long spiel? Okay, thank you, Harris and Derek. Hey. Uh, okay, the question is that, hey, how are you guys? Listen, uh, I have been through what you have, you are going through. I mean, basically, I've been an atheist. In, I, I didn't declare myself to be atheist when I was young, like you guys are. I actually ended up writing even a song called Angels Are Not From Heaven and The Devil And From Hell. If you go around in this muddy world, you'll know and you'll tell, right? So, uh, but what I see is religion is needed for the guys who have, you know, the, because faith does give you some hope. It does give millions and millions of people some satisfaction. And when I see uh, the questions like from Harris, uh, yes, destroy all religions, is that is total arrogance. Come on, how do you expect to destroy all religion when it's and hope through discourse. some sort of a satisfaction for millions okay. of people. I think we got your point. We got your we got your point. So let, let me let me get this one first. Um, and I'm sure Derek has a lot to say add as well. Um, so destroy all religions is uh, you say how we can ask this question because we can destroy uh, just like the previous theologies that we've had um, uh, through test of time, through criticism, through discourse. We can destroy that. Nobody, there are no. Um, Tor believers left anymore unless you're a Marvel fan. Um, you know, all, all the, the thousands of dead religions. So that's how we can destroy them by logic and evidence and giving our uh, making arguments against them. That's how we can really uh, d- destroy them. So, so there's nothing wrong in that word. I think you just have a if you have an affinity to it. That's probably why it's a bit too harsh for you. If, for example, if you use the word, can we, can we, how, how can we destroy atheism? I would know exactly you mean the idea of atheism. Fine, bring it on. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but the first part, you said it brings a lot of hope to people. Well, I don't, I don't think it does. I mean, so or, or even if it does, uh, if if your hope is built on false ideas and false promises, then that hope isn't that good. Like, I mean, I can get drunk and I can imagine I'm the king of the world, and maybe you know, jump uh, out of a building thinking that I can fly. People have these kind of ideas when they are hallucinating or. Uh, deluded, I would say, and hence the word, the God delusion. So um, I'm sorry, but this is, uh, if it doesn't stand the the, the scientific method or the the best method that we have to observe reality or how to distinguish between reality and fiction, then I'm sorry whether whether that hope is, whether it gives you hope or not, that's, that's irrelevant. How do you answer that? Derek. Um, I'm more of a softy, so I wouldn't have approached it with destroy. I would say change because I think that um, if you say destroy, this is me psychologically, I put myself in the Christian shoes, I would think you're only wanting to attack and it doesn't sound like you're trying to replace it with something. It, it, it sounds that way. You know what I mean? So like for me, I would say I want to change the world religions, have them evolve and to progress 
getting out of their dark age thinking, uh, getting out of their bronze age thinking, getting out of their iron age thinking and recognizing modern morales are better. Slavery was never good in any respect ever. No holy book can justify that. No holy book should be able to justify that. And so I think when we look at these things, I think that if we're trying to reach people who are in the religion, maybe those are strong words. And so destroy my defend. Whereas the goal is to change, get the people of the religions to change. I have progressive Christians and progressive uh, Jews, for example, and I have some progression Muslims that I actually talk to. And they're, you could tell that they've been influenced by Western society in their thinking, which I think is great. But you can also tell that they don't even believe in most of the stuff the radical fundamentalist views of these religions do. So my approach would be maybe wording it differently, even though at the end of the day, I think you mean what I mean. And it's getting people to see the, the reality of what we now know is better than what they once did then in many respects. So, uh, yeah, I do think that religion gives people hope, even if it is false hope. You know, uh, when we look at like the book of Daniel in the Bible, there's a place in the book of Daniel where there's this promise that the end is about to happen. Um, it's all going to wrap up here soon. And Tychus Epiphanes is about to destroy the Jews and there's going to be a war. And he gives them hope. Like we're going to win this battle. Now they, they don't, it fails. This is why I have academics come on my channel. But if you're in a war and you're thinking, I need my men to believe this is true, even if the odds aren't in our favor, and then it ends up being false, you kind of give them what we call a noble lies. And a noble lies telling someone who just lost a loved one, don't worry, you'll see them again, even if it's not true. So like, it's right. like, you see what I'm saying? So I don't think, I think we should try to cope with reality like you're saying, Harris, but I think that, I had a friend of mine who overdosed recently and his sister said like, God couldn't keep him here. He was too good for this world. And, uh, and I know I'm going to see him again soon. And she was crying and I just nodded. Like, I'm not going to break that bubble. Cause it's like, first of all, she's mourning. And, but at the end of the day, in reality, I'm thinking in my head, you know, we've been taught this, we've been told this and not valuing this, what we have now. And that death is a part of life. Why are we like, losing our mind and anyway there's a whole bunch yeah. to be said on this but that's all, all right well uh, christian muslim you got your answer you got two different thank types guys, of atheists that's one all. A bit more. thank you for the answer thank you thank you you got you got one militant atheist and one you know cuddly softly i am a spoken. definite teddy bear yeah. dude but i yeah, am so. but the mission is very similar we have very common yeah. goals oh yeah absolutely and um i i, I would agree on one part where you said that when there's a grieving person you would think my recently not so recently about a couple of years ago uh one of my my one of my aunties died she died very young well she was probably 55 she probably didn't even cross 60 very young all of a sudden came came as a shock and i spoke with my uncle and he knew who i was and what i'm doing but then he was very sad and he was like and he was bringing up god and that was his mm -hmm. coping mechanism I don't say anything. I don't bring anything. I was like, I was just nodding as well. I was, uh, that, that's, that's called, again, that goes from, that comes from a position of being humane and being compassionate. So the, the, you, you understand that there's no, you're not going to go to your soldiers, for example. So it's not just in the context of religion. You're not going to go to your soldiers and you're going to say, well, you know what? The enemy is so strong. They've got everything. They're going to, freaking kill all of you right and we won't even be able to get one of their guys you're, you're not going to do it right so so we understand that that how we can but again the point is what would you want to be would you want to be a person who wants to remain in your bubble or you want to actually ask yourself i reckon when we are at our lowest i think that's the time when we actually ask the biggest questions and i think that's the time when we um, come to some really profound observations that we may not be able to. And, uh, you know, people like Sam Harris and all these guys that talk about trying different psychedelics and there's a consciousness alteration um, uh, substances. Why do they say that? I actually had a slight experience not so long ago. And I was like, okay, well, I, as a rationalist, I never saw that. But I understand that. My point is there are so many other boxes in your life that need to be ticked 
but they need to be ticked. But if you if you just say that I'm in this bubble, then you know you you would never get an opportunity to ask that again. Yes, it's, and, and some of those boxes need to be checked by yourself. You don't need someone to come here and say, "Hey, sorry, you know what? Your mother just died, and she's never you're never going to see her. The, the the bitch is gone." You can't say that. Yeah. You would you would that would be an ultimate dick thing to say. But when there's a place time and place for everything. Um, so, so, so I agree with you, but I don't entirely agree with you that that, and, and again, I, th I, th I think there's no right or wrong answer. You, I mean, you could have easily said the change or not destroy. Um, I, I, I get that. But again, we have actually, we actually have testimonies from people as well who are affected or impacted or they change the worldview through a bit of an aggressive stance and then some are softly spoken ones and then the both work, they all work. There's some people that say, well, how I prefer dare you? the soft. Yeah. For me, I, it's my, what happened to me is I was addicted to drugs for many years. And when I got clean off drugs, I was my empathy for people who are struggling. I equate mm -hmm. drug addiction in many ways to religion, uh, to, to like really fundamentalist religion, people who actually buy into the religion. I equate that addiction, that mental obsession for the drugs where you go, just quit, just quit the drugs. And they can't just quit. They, they don't have anything to replace it with. So oh, yeah. I empathize for people who are in it. And sometimes it takes that harsh popping their bubble. People like uh, uh, Sam Harris and others, Richard Dawkins and other people that are really more aggressive, militant, anti-theist. Whereas for me, I'm like, I want them to know that I'm their friend. And I want to get in close. And I want them to know, like, I know what it's like to believe in a delusion, to actually convince oneself that there are angels and demons and things like that everywhere. But at the end of the day, there's a reason I don't believe it. And maybe if you realize that, like the guy who converted me or got me to exit my fundamentalist bubble, he didn't come militant. He approached me and said, hey, I'd like to have a conversation. Can I show you a few things? Mm -hmm. And when he did, I asked him, I finally knew he was up to something. I said, hey, dude, I got to ask you, are you an atheist? I, I won't stop talking to you, I told him, but I just want to know. But really, I was thinking in my head, should I have been listening to this guy? I was already getting ready to back out. I wanted to leave. And he said, look, I don't care if you're a believer or not. I want to talk to you as a friend, but I'm not going to lie to you. Yes, I am an atheist. And I started well, I had, going, yeah. what? And, 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 and it worked for you. And, and this, is what, this is what I mean. For, for example, in my case, well, I listened to Hitchens and Dawkins. I mean, yeah. I, I was shocked what, what, when I heard what Dawkins was saying. But then that appealed to me. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. so I'm. So my point is, the different approaches to this, they all work on different people differently. So, so there is no in that one. There is no right or wrong, wrong answer in my in my opinion. Um, so, uh, which is fair enough. I, you you you'd, you'd think that that would be, like for example, you use the word deluded. Even that word might be very offensive for a lot of people. So right, right. Where right. do you draw the line? And yeah, then within yeah. that. Within that, we'll have some people who would say that, oh, hang on, Harris is a bit more militant. But then Derek is actually not that nice either because he call, he thinks that I'm deluded and he compares us with drug addicts. <laughs> right. You They'll know? take that. Yeah. I, I mean, obviously, that would offend anybody. But I do think that when people are – they don't realize what they're in and they're stuck in something, I have empathy. They'll say I'm stuck. Well, at least show me some empathy. I can respect the fact that they're trying to show empathy, even if they think that it's wrong. And you show empathy too. I'm just saying, yeah. like, oh, yeah. like I just want. Oh yeah, when people... we talk, we talk. Yeah, we, we, when we talk, and yeah, no, no, I agree with you. And I, I became a big believer of that because I, when, when I started my activism, I used to think, that, how do I approach this? How do I approach yeah. this? And there's some moments I, I, I would definitely say that I'm on kind of a bit of an offensive side, but. I've, since then, I've seen far more offensive people. So I'm like, wait, yeah. you know what? I'm I'm not bad. So, so I'll, I'll, right. I'll, I'll go with that. But again, we've had we've got results. We've got testimonies from all kinds of people. We've got the people very hawkish about their approach, uh, about their attack on religion, mm -hmm. and then the, the the people like me, and then the people like you. You've got yeah. someone, you know, and and then we've got this whole different class of people that are academics. They would never bring anything into it. There's no there's no human element. It's just purely academic work, and then that affects people as well so anyway mm -hmm. so let's just get on a couple of more yeah. callers we've got we've got nuria there as well i think nuria wanted to say something as well i don't know we've got Apollos, dali friendly muslim and mr delicious uh we're going to take you all very quickly nuria how you doing what what do you hi want to good thank you i will keep this very quick um first of all derek my condolences about your friend um i'm really really sorry oh, to hear too. that 
Thank you. I heard about um, that, and, and I think I did send you a message. So yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, not yeah. heartless. Yeah. Yeah, and also yeah. that's why it's just so important that you also, alongside everything you're doing, you normalize the discussion around addiction. And you know, even that's still like there's a taboo about people accepting that they have a problem, getting help, and, uh, NA, whatever it is, rehab. Um, so yeah, thank you for doing that alongside. Um, I'm going to keep the question um, related to the the topic of this chat. Um, so Derek, again, thank you so much, but also kind of annoyed by you because you sent me down massive rabbit holes. I've been looking into Christianity lately um, because obviously even as, as Islam being the youngest of the Abrahamic faiths, um, any stories that kind of come out of a Christian context or a Jude like a, a Judaic context or even a Gnostic context is relevant to me because it just helps put the pieces together for, you know, where Islam is copied and pasted and meshed up the story and just given us half truths. So I was watching your stuff with, um, is it Ralph Ellis? I think on yeah. like the, yeah, so the historical Adam and Eve, the historical Jesus, historical Paul, Saul, Josephus's writing, all of this, I've, I've literally spent the last couple of nights just like plowing through these videos. And I wanted to ask you, so how do you feel if you were, I'm, I'm guessing slightly into, let's say the mythicist element, and now you've had Jesus, discussions where Jesus has kind of been put back into the historical narrative and given some context around it. Mm -hmm. um, and usually you're just kind of going back and forth with these academics um, and exploring their theories. And I just wanted to know where's your head at and, and how have you placed this? So when you think of Jesus and the stories, um, is it still like, are you leaning towards, yeah, there could be some historical backing or this is maybe just a man that's been mythicized and like, you know, like like Hercules just kind of like exaggerated over time. Where, where do you stand? So uh, just to try and keep it direct, thank you for the question and thank you for what you're doing. Um, on the Ralph Ellis thing, I used to like really not know any of the academic stuff. And so he has interesting, I would call them conspiracy theories. And then sometimes they might mm -hmm. have some, some stuff's pretty cool, but he, he's kind of a conspiracy guy on his position. He thinks that Jesus is a descendant of Cleopatra and Julius Caesar. Like there's just, all uh -huh. sorts of funny and stuff. And Arthur Norton, the Garden of Eden and right, all of that. Right. Now, that's an interesting question that I have. I don't know how much validity is there, but I do think there is Egyptian and Mesopotamian influence that is going on in Genesis. As far as Jesus goes, I am at the point now after you know reading and studying all the mythicists and then reading and studying these people who say there was definitely a historical Jesus. Their camps, they call them maximalist and minimalist. So if you're mm -hmm. a maximalist, you think Jesus... A maximalist Jesus uh, person would be someone who thinks he literally walked on water, was born of a virgin, rose from the dead, like the whole nine. That would be your right. full on Christian minimalist. If you go way over, you could become a mythicist to the point where like none of this happened. It's all myth. There is no historical kernel. Jesus is an invented figure, just like Hercules, just like Zeus, just like um, Asclepius, whatever, you know, other different gods. And then you have people who are minimalist historicist. I would fall into that camp right now. I think okay. there was probably a Jewish rabbi similar to what we see, let's say, in the Qumran sect. So the Dead Sea Scrolls can tell you they had a teacher of righteousness. He taught many great things to these Jewish people who followed him. Uh, he may have done what they called wonder workings that obviously the, the miracles have been embellished. He might have been a guy who actually did little small um, kind of like you see in third world countries today where they do little miracle things on the side streets and people think these are gurus and whatnot. He may have been one yeah. of these figures. Um, I don't know that. I'm saying it's possible because the data that we have is really not trustworthy. And I'll, I, like it really isn't. Even when you read Paul, Paul already has a Jesus figure that he calls Christ that is already deified. Exactly. He, He's already in apotheosis. So th this, this Jesus Christ has already died and ascended on high. That's called an apotheosis at this time. So did Julius Caesar. So did Caesar Augustus. So did Heracles. After he burned himself in the pyre, he has an apotheosis. Like the list goes on and on of demigods and gods that had this happen to him. There are real historical people who have been, what you use the term, mythologized. And I think that's what happened to this character we call Jesus. I think this was a guy who was completely mythologized and 
all the literature that we have left is theological. So it's like you're sifting through all this hay to find a diamond and the diamond is historical. And can we trust that that's historical literature or not? That's the hard part. This is why academics on the history side can't really just sift through and say what Jesus really did and what Jesus really didn't do. And I just mm -hmm. think it's more plausible based on the data we have that there was probably a guy. The mythicist side that says he didn't exist thinks he was an angel in heaven mm. and that he descends out of heaven at some point into the lower heavens, is born of a woman, whatever that means, manufactured of the seed of David, is born, lives this life in heaven somewhere in the third heaven, probably in the Garden of Eden area where Adam was, because he's the last Adam. Our friend last Adam should jump on about this one. But anyway, um, he's the last Adam, which would mean he's reversing everything the first Adam did. And he's in the Garden of Eden in the third heaven. So it, it goes on and on and on and on and on. I could tell you a million things, but... It's, yeah, it's, no, that was perfect. Thank you. I kind of just wanted to see your stance on it. And I found it really interesting how um, like revisionists or historians are coming now and they're saying, okay, that this can work if we just mess with the chronology either side and then we'll just fix the chasm. And then it kind of picks up this proper historical narrative where it all fits into place. Um, so I've just been exploring all of that. And yeah, I just wanted to know, I was like, what does Derek think of having all this information presented to him and then, you know, like from various sides. So yeah, thank you so much for answering my question perfectly. Cheers, Harris. Cheers, Derek. Bye guys. See you, Nuria. One comment, Despite if I might just say the data, the evidence that we have, the text we have, I would not be dogmatic on this at all because it's just not great. If we had archeological evidence or something that like that would help, that would be great, but it's just not great evidence. But there's another similarity because now recently uh, in the age of social media, when people can actually put forward a lot of ideas, there's an idea revolving around Muhammad's um, uh, mythicism as well. Um, but the key difference here is Muhammad became a, basically a ruler, the ruler of Arabia. And he, so he must have left some independent footprint, but a lot of historians have actually said that, you know, it's not really, there's not a lot of footprint there. So, so there's a dark area, there's this dark part of history from around about 100 years or something that we don't find in a lot of independent evidence. Yes, Muslims have presented letters and all that, but the, the, they've been, none of them have been independently, scientifically verified. But in the case of Jesus, why it actually, the, this the Jesus mythicism, uh, theory has stuck for quite some time now. I think it was some Canadian professor who initially put that forward. Um, but, but I'm sure there have been other people have cast doubts on that um, throughout history, maybe at some point. But, but Jesus was right in the middle of the greatest civilization the world had ever seen. Mm -hmm. So Jesus was, you know, he was nailed to a cross at a time when people could have been there who would have documented everything, but maybe you could argue the fact that he, in his life, or by the time he, he died or was killed, he hadn't really achieved any kind of influence that Muhammad ended up gaining by the time he died. So, so um, in both cases, I mean, there should have been some, there, there should have been some kind of independent evidence, but, uh, but yeah, but, it, it, it's quite a big question mark but again i think it, in both cases it all goes back to as you said theology like the only mm -hmm. evidence we have is, is theological in nature then well independent people critical thinkers can't really trust that can they no there's a there's there's a lot there's a lot here i, yeah, I mean we can get we'll into josephus yeah. there's a statement a couple statements in josephus that are um, you know 40 years after yeah, 40 years or so. Mentioned once. That was also yeah. a second-hand account. Yeah. And to know whether or not – yeah, there's a lot here because one of them has been tampered with for sure. We're not sure about the other one. There's people who debate this. But, but yeah, as far as this time period, you know how this difficulty is down in Arabia trying to find evidence of Muhammad. Well, the same problem happens in the Galilee where – the only historians we'd have documenting is Philo of Alexandria, which lives in Alexandria, Egypt, isn't even near Galilee. And then you have Josephus, who's commenting about a few other Galilean people. Then you have the Talmud, which comes centuries later, which is trying to remark of other Jewish type of miracle workers like Honey the Circle Drawer and other things like that. It's, it's kind of a dark area as well, because in Galilee, as Bart Ehrman says, there's not very many literate people at all, if anyone was literate. So... Mm all you'd have are word of mouth stories being passed along. You wouldn't have 
literature being written. And all this to say, for those who are Christians in the chat, you're hinging your entire existence off of something like this because you can't prove it didn't happen. Mm. Like, that's kind of silly to me. It's like, you can't prove Caesar Augustus didn't have uh, portents about his his birth to come. Read this book, Suetonius, Lives of the Caesars. It's such a fun read. Go to the part about Augustus Caesar, who's the first emperor of Rome, and he has an apotheosis. He has miracles. When he's born, the Senate's trying to kill him. Doesn't that sound like Matthew? When he's born, the leaders of Israel, Herod and his household, are trying to kill the children, the infants, the newborns. Yeah. That's what's happening here in this. This is Greek Roman literature Roman, around the yeah. same time of Jesus. Why is this not true, but your Jesus is? It makes no sense, bro. It, it, there's way more about... um. Augustus than there is about Jesus, way more. And and, and Suetonius was a chronicler. He was a historian. He actually yep. it, 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 he followed some sort of uh, you know uh, their own academic standards at the time, and then Tacitus and all that. They they, they documented detail uh, all, all these events quite quite a lot in detail. Yes, yep. albeit that they were also mythological in nature because mm-hmm. a lot of time they were chronic they, they were writing about it, emperors that had lived hundred years behind them. But but this is. Yeah, uh, and we can throw that out. That's a very good question. We could throw away m- these myths related to Augustus Caesar, but sorry, with Jesus, mm. even though there were, yeah, th- this that, one's that's, true, that's Derek. Very, you haven't experienced the Lord. That's what they'll say. Yeah. Oh, yes, I have, but I found out it was probably chemical compounds and a social yeah. construct that caused me to feel these things. But anyway, that's a very difficult one. All right, let's just take a couple of more calls. And uh, Derek, I know you have to go as well, but I'm gonna put you on a speedboat here just okay. go through as Push quickly me. as you can very quickly how did how do the how, how do christians reconcile the character of god in the new testament versus the old testament that's a common question that we get asked as muslims we say well hang on this is what's written in deuteronomy and leviticus and they say mm-hmm. well no we're, we don't believe in that can, can they really that easily avoid that uh, they do but that's the can problem they? well it it depends on who you ask because this debate happened right out the gate with christians There's a okay, so there's a man named Marcion in the second century, the beginning of the second century, who started to say, Yeah, there are prophecies in the Hebrew Bible, but look, this is gonna sound weird, but the creator is evil. Okay, this is this idea starts to come in in Gnosticism that the creator in Adam and Eve, Genesis, and the flood and things like that, Marcion's writing about, man, if you just read the Hebrew Bible, he it's like he had a moral moral compass like we do. And he said, I read that book, and there's no way that Jesus' father, this loving God that we keep hearing about, is love this, love that, love this. He can't be that creator that we're reading about in Genesis. So he's saying that the Hebrew Bible is like irrelevant because mm. the this God of Jesus, the father of Jesus, is actually the God of that God. And that God, the creator God that's evil, doesn't even know it. He doesn't even know that Jesus' father is his God. This is early Christian writing, man. Marcionism was on fire. Christians loved it. He had a lot of other little teachings. Huh? How early? Uh, 130 to 140 AD. So 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 that early on. That early. But that seems like even that guy's moral compass is really good, like even by the standards at the time. It sounds... Hang on, this can't happen, yeah. Yeah, but this is the thing interesting about it, and this is why I get into the dating of the New Testament. The Gospel of John has some really funny stuff, and Paul has some funny stuff in his letters in Corinthians. In the Gospel of John, you remember that part where it talks about uh, to the Jews, he says something about you are the you are the seed of, or yeah, you are the children of the devil. Like he's called, like in the Gospel of John, they call the Jews devils. Okay, it's pretty anti-Jewish. I mean, like, it's really anti-Jewish in the Gospel of John. Anti-Semitic. Anti-Semitic. The Bible is anti-Semitic. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of problems within the New Testament, and scholars wrestle with this. But here's the interesting note about that in John. In the Greek, the translation in English we have is kind of whitewashed. In the right. Greek, it says that you are of the father of the devil, or something to the— there's a father of the devil. Equating the, the Jews' God— with the evil creator and that he has a father and this is the God I'm trying to teach you a God of love. So this issue between old and new Testament Christians will just go, that was the old covenant. And all of that was nailed to the cross on Jesus. But, but Jews don't see it like that at all. There's no concept of father 
Oh, obviously, oh, they wouldn't consider there's... themselves as a devil. Yeah. But they, do, they, do they call themselves? Do they call their God Father? Later in Second Temple Judaism, yes, you could see this in in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So Jews started to do that. Yes. So the Quran actually says that, and we criticize the Quran a lot on that. We they, there's a story in the Quran which says, um, and and I'm just quoting other biblical scholars, big ones too, who say. Uh, the Quran basically says the son of uh, um, uh, these Jews call um, is Ezra the son of God. Mm -hmm. But then people say, well, Jews never make that claim. There is no concept of that's Christians who say, you know, father no, and the son and the Holy not Spirit. Not true. That's a false statement. Yeah. Yeah. The, the so Jews... Ezra, so, so there was a segment of Jews who said that, you know. Oh, that, yeah. I mean, that, yeah, there were second Jews are not monolithic either. Their thinking wasn't monolithic. Even in the New Testament, you hear Sadducees, Pharisees, Sanhedrin. You have these Essenes that Josephus talks about. But in the Qumran scrolls that we find, the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's a community there with Enochian literature. They call God Father. They, there are references to them. Not all of them do. Not all of their literature makes these points. The big, but Book of Enoch. Book one Enoch is in Dead Sea Scrolls. So you, you find God being referenced as a father, yes, which is why there are people who say, I'm not so sure Marcion's theory is correct, but no church father has it correct. They're all reading this literature, and I think they're developing Christianity as we're reading the early church fathers. Justin Martyr, all of these people, Christianity is becoming Christianity mm. in the second century. It was not that in the first. The, the earliest Christians based on scholarship were Jews. They weren't Christians. They were Jews. They were expecting oh, the yeah. end to happen any moment. They're apocalyptic Jews who think the end of the world is going to happen at any moment. And then this Christ figure comes in. And here's Paul. He believes, I think, Paul of Fredrickson wrote a book, that Paul's going to go for the nations. He's got to fulfill prophecy that the nations one day will come and believe in the God of Israel. So as he's bringing this message to pagans out in the middle of uh, Athens and other places, he's using their ideas and he has all this pagan material that you see included, like eat my flesh and drink my blood. The Old Testament condemns any such blood drinking or anything like that. Here it's coming from the mouth of Jesus to have a Eucharist. What the heck is going on? This is not a Jewish thing. This is outside influence impacting this Jewish movement and Paul's of course, taking it to non-Jews. So if you want a message that's going to get non-Jews, you got to make sure it looks somewhat non-Jewish. Anyway, all we can right. get into all sorts of stuff. There's yeah. Well, okay. Speedboat. Um, Speedboat, baby. Uh, <laughs> the Aquarian TV saying, Derek, what do you think about Christianity and Islam as a Jewish creation to subvert the Gentile world into worshiping a jewish god mm, that's smell a conspiracy yeah it is a conspiracy position um i've talked to adam green on this adam green has the same uh position i personally don't think it's necessary i don't think it's like a, a purpose intention to try and like create a conspiracy yeah. to do it True i think enough. that it's part of their text and i'm not sure about islam i'm i'm fairly confident that in early christianity Paul is going to the nations. He uses the Greek word. He uses the LXX for his scripture. His intention is to fulfill Bible prophecy. It doesn't require a conspiracy as much as it is, we're going to fulfill Bible prophecy. Kind of like Zionists today want to bring Jews back to Israel so that the end and Jesus could come back. They believe that if they bring all the Jews back to Israel, they'll fulfill Bible prophecy and the end will happen. I think Paul's doing the same thing. It's not like a secret it's not like a secret. I think he believes his text and he's trying to fulfill Bible prophecy by getting the nations, the non-Jews, to join this movement before the end of time. So I, I don't yeah. I, I know Adam puts a lot on that conspiracy there, and he might does say he do so it for, does, he, does he bring Islam into it as well or just Christianity? He does bring Islam into it, and Islam's a different breed of something. Oh. To me, it uses Christianity. I don't, I don't buy that at all. I, 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 don't, I wouldn't buy that at all. Like yeah. as far as Islam is concerned, I think Muhammad was because he made some very basic mistakes as well in just understanding Christianity. So if there was someone who was planning all of that, wouldn't have made those basic mistakes. But 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 again, it's, it's too conspiratorial for me. Like if if it's yeah. too complicated, there's so many cogs in the machine that if one is out of its place, then you know the whole machine breaks down. So I I, I don't I don't yeah. Well, I don't, remember I don't my anti-Jewish point of the Gospel of John. Why yeah, would devils. Jews? Children why would devils. Jews create this? 
to have yeah. them be enemies of themselves. I mean, one can try to say they did this on purpose so that they themselves would end up in a bad spot by Christians. I just no. don't see it being the case. I think that there are more ground up natural explanations for the development of these things that don't require the conspiracy level. And the same thing for Muhammad. I think that, it, you know, look at the the attacks towards Jews not being Muslims. And there's yeah. this, why would a Jew create a religion that literally be so to be against his <laughs> own people? And maybe one wants to argue, Derek, don't you see it? That's also fulfilling Bible prophecy. I don't think yeah. it is. I think that the Jews are hoping that they would end up on top of the world that they would reign and that one day yeah. everyone would acknowledge the god of israel yeah one can argue that's not a, that's not the best way to go about it but right. by further right. dividing it and, and and casting doubts in the original theology of uh, judaism so yeah yeah I, I, I don't buy that at all but can we compare the trinity to avatars i don't know i avatar the movie <laughs> yeah no um or altars the hindu altars it might the... <laughs> That's possible. I don't. I don't know. I haven't heard any good arguments to try and do that. Yeah, I think it is talking about like Hindu avatars and other things. Um, the the I, correct word is avatars, by the way. Just, just saying. I, I don't know. To be honest with you, I don't know. I think the development of the Trinity has happened that it happened to evolve. So it's not something that was just there. I mean, they're literally trying to nail this down in the fourth century. Even it, it existed a little bit before this, but. They're trying to nail that down as the official doctrine of Christianity in the fourth century. Like it wasn't fixed. This is why you have Arian, you know, coming on that Jesus isn't God and different ideas that are going on. They're still debating it. They don't even know because the texts yeah. are not clear. You can find what you want to if you look hard enough. That's all. Yeah, exactly. That's a good good quote. Uh, very quickly, Battle is saying, I meant that there are places where belief in God is still very normal. It is common sense to believe in god in many places in africa asia and south america does this make any difference in why christianity is reducing in the west so i, I okay so that's the part that we didn't understand so I, I think he's saying that it's beneficial for people it makes mm -hmm. sense to believe in a god and hence people believe in africa asia and south america and if we extend that then obviously in europe and america and north america as well but then why is it happening? Does it make any difference in why Christianity is... Do you get that? I fully Does get this it. make any difference in why Christianity is reducing in the West? So, so you're saying that people in the West are, if, if I understand it correctly, that maybe they're losing common sense? I, I, that, or, because I don't know. I don't get it. I don't know if they're coming from a faith side or if they're coming from a skeptical side. Because th if this question is to address it, does this make any difference that people in, let's say, Africa, Asia, and South America are very religious in it, in it, and they're saying that it's common sense to believe in these religions? Um, does this make any difference or impact in Christ in why Christianity is reducing in the West? I don't think that is. I think that it's the advancement of critical thinking and scholarly scientific method and things like that, that are starting to get people to question. It's even being philosophically skeptical that are getting people to start realizing, do we need these things? So I think it's very normative that humans believe in things that they can't see. It's part of our evolution, in fact. Like you hear the, they, we always talk about this in our evolutionary explanations. Like you hear that little noise in the bush. If it's a lion and I take, pay attention to that and I just take precaution and I survive. If I ignore that little noise in the bush and it is a lion and it attacks and kills me, well, I'm going to die out. So in our evolutionary, in our evolution, we assume things that may not be true. My door can slam shut right now. I'm going to assume a human did it. I'm going to assume a human did it. It could be any other cause, but I'm going to assume a human did it, number one, and then go from there. So um, I think that that's why Christianity is reducing is we're actually able to freely discuss and be critical of Christianity. You can't be as critical of Islam without being called Islamophobic by most people. You can't be critical of Judaism without becoming someone who's anti-Semitic. And I do play, I do think it's worth mentioning, be cautious because if your hard on is only for Jews, if your hard on is only for Muslims, it is going to look like you hate a people group. And if you are being critical, be fair, bring criticism. Like, like today you're doing Harris, you're bringing someone bringing critical thought to Christianity. If, all you're doing is focusing on, focusing on Islam, it can be viewed by public eye that you just hate Muslims or you're an anti-Islam anti or you're Islamophobe, whatever. 
and I think that there's a gray fine line between being critical of it and then being someone who actually is a bigot and hates these things. So I don't know well, if, if I'm answering this properly, but I well, think that saying you got it. You got it. He, he did. Battler did leave a comment and say, you got it right. Like, okay. Good. You good. Good. The question right. Okay. Um, okay. So we're just going to go bang, bang. So Fraz was the first one. Bang, oh, bang, and, bang. um, there was another guy he left as well. I think I was going to take him next, but anyway. Oh um, yes, so Fraz, very quickly, what would you like to say? You're Jesus' slave of Allah. Yes, he is a slave of Allah. <laughs> yeah, I, I just want to talk about Paul because uh, I think you know he was a he was a false apostle as well, and uh, and all these Christians, yeah, you know when it question them about their scriptures all day all their court is Paul nothing else nothing else they just quote right. Galatians Romans they say this and that yeah but this man Paul yeah there's so much evidence that he was a false apostle complete false apostle one of the one of the reasons why is because if you uh, read the book of Acts here yeah, he went to the churches of Asia, yeah, Church of Asia Minor. He went there, and and every single one of them hated him and they wanted to kill him. So they come to uh, Israel to kill him off, but the Romans helped him. So the Romans. So your question is: So if I understand it correctly, your question is: Why do Christians always only they're quoting Paul? They're right? quoting him. Yeah, this this man Paul has never met Jesus at, oh. at all. He never met Jesus right. in okay. once in his life. Yeah. So okay. why are these Christians quoting him all the time, saying, saying that he's a he's he's our highest authority in the scriptures? Is Real he, quick, okay. If I may, is he, first, is he the highest authority? First of all, but I, I, thanks, Brad, let, let Derek answer. I do want to I do want to ask one question before I answer this in in any sufficiency. Um, if he's a false apostle. And, and, and I'm, I'm just trying to get your thinking here. Then how do you know that Jesus is actually a slave of Allah? Like, how do you know he is really, truly who he says he is? If you're Muslim, because he's in the right. scriptures. He's, he's in the scriptures. He's, 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 he's in the New Testament and he's in the Quran as well. You trust the New Testament? I trust, I trust parts of the Old Testament, parts of it. Do you trust uh, anything that isn't Paul in the New Testament? What what books in the New Testament do you trust? I just I just I just trust what uh, what you know what Jesus taught. Everything that he was teaching was Islam in their in their own scriptures. In any of the Gospels. So if I go in the Gospel right now and I see anything Jesus said, you believe that those are really the words of Jesus? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go on, go on. Quote one. No, I'm just asking if no, that's no, no, what you. Everything, everything that he taught, like he, like he taught in a, a Mark chapter twelve, verse twenty-nine, when the when the people asked him what's the highest commandment, and he said, "Hear, Israel, the Lord our God is one." No, yeah. no, that is Islam, and then he taught people to uh, to help the. Paul as well, no. and then it said, uh, okay, so, so Friday, I got your point. I, I, I got your point, but I, I, I think there's because I want Derek to understand it correctly. So I think it's coming from a Muslim point. Of view, yes, I know point. it is, and that's why I'm asking these questions. Yeah. I wasn't asking so, you for no reason. So, I, yeah, so when when he says that, okay, well, I believe in the new te the New Testament and other uh, uh, apostles. He actually means, and I'm sorry, Surprise, I think you'd agree with me, but you might not be happy the way I'm putting it forward. Is that he actually says that as long as it doesn't conflict with the Quran. So whatever bits you might right. quote from whichever New Testament, as long as in your understanding or whoever you follow, whoever you've read, that is compatible yeah. with the right. theology of Islam. That's mm -hmm. what you believe in. And it, to me, it seems like Paul apparently seems like Paul is, you know, very... He's not. He's not that compatible with Islam. So, right, so right. let's let's just go with now. Now let's drill into no. also because I think we understand where Safra is coming from. Safra, let him answer. Okay. So first things first. The reason well, I asked is I wanted to see if you would say that the words Jesus says in the Gospels, if Jesus says it, let's say you get your New Testament, it's words in red, 
and you say, well, whatever Jesus taught, I agree with, but I don't agree with Paul. Yeah. The reason I ask you this question is because I interview academics, uh, scholars all the time yeah. on my channel, and they will tell you that oftentimes, probably 50% of the time, maybe, I don't know, I'm putting a number out there, the words that Jesus says in the Gospels are actually oftentimes impacted by Pauline theology because the Gospels come after Paul's letters. So here you have a case where yeah. if, you, if you say, I agree with, with Jesus, but I don't agree with Paul, Paul may have impacted Mark. The Gospel of Mark may have been written by someone, there's a very good chance, by someone who's Pauline. But if you find things that you can go, yeah. I can get on board with that, the Shema. I can I can get on board. The Lord our God is one. And, you know, Jesus said that, you know, because it's in the Hebrew Bible and I can agree with that. But if I took the words of Jesus where he says, eat my flesh and drink my blood in the Gospel of John. And he says, you cannot live forever unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood. Do you believe Jesus actually said that? And do you agree with that teaching? He didn't. He didn't really. He That's against his mind. He, he didn't, didn't you know, really mean that. He just, you know, had it as, you know, as an example to, you know, follow him. That was it. He didn't, he didn't, you know, really, you know, mean that. Well, what if I, what if I could show you other examples contemporaneous to the Gospels where mystery cults were literally digesting the flesh and blood of their gods in order to have immortality? If it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck and it walks like a duck, why didn't he mean it if all the other religions that are around this in the Greco-Roman world are saying the very similar things? I don't need to go 700 years later. I don't need to go, you know, in the Old Testament to find it because you're not going to find it there. This is something they put in the mouth of Jesus. I don't think Jesus really said this. If there was a historical Jesus who's a Jew, I do not for one second think he really said Eat my flesh, drink my blood, and you will have everlasting life. I am the true bread who comes down out of heaven, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think that he said this. I think this is theological, and I think that this is an embellishment, writing mythology. But the reason I ask is, if you think the, wor the words in the Gospels are true, these are words Jesus spoke. And what you're no. having to do is reinterpret what he meant. No, and but the main, the, the, tell you about that. the main thing that he was talking about is to keep the keep the laws of the of god he was always on about it. keep the laws but this this person come after him paul's come after and he and and, and he's uh teaching everyone to go against the laws to you know to eat whatever you want do what you want and this what so did all the other apostles but so did Which all was, the other apostles no, huh? no no they didn't no they didn't it was only it was only him he he went to the asian um, minor the if in churches, you went there and it died to know. According to the book of Acts, no. Peter actually, and I, there's a lot here, there's so much to unpack. Just simply put, Peter is doing things that Paul supposedly did in Acts. So if not, you'd have to throw away the book of Acts because the book of Acts makes Peter go to a guy named Cornelius. He talks to a woman named Tabitha. He, he resurrects a woman named Tabitha, a guy named Aeneid. He heals who had some illness. Um, and he's he's literally going to these non-Israelites, these non-Jews, and he's converting them. And they do not have to keep kosher. They do not have to keep Sabbath. They do not have to keep the law. And supposedly Peter's given a thumbs up to that. But the problem is this, is in Matthew's gospel, it's very Torah observant. He yeah, says, in the day you'll say, I did this in your name and that in your name. But you know what? Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So, oh, yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. it depends on what book you go to. They contradict. So I know uh, that as an Islam, as a Muslim, you that doesn't bother you because to, in your head, like you're like, well, it, it's really the final arbiter is the Quran and Muhammad yes. and things like that. But at the end of the day, knowing what Jesus actually said, I mean, I'm with you. I think he was probably a Jew who practiced Torah and taught Torah, and that's that's about the furthest I would go. But one more thing, one more thing, yeah, one more thing, brother, yeah. Jesus never ever said that he was God, not in a single verse shows that he's God. But why do Christians, most of them, worship him as Love God? Him, yeah. A single verse. Yeah. We always ask him, show us one single verse that can never come out with a single verse. I've asked Adam Seeker as well, that hypocrite. Adam Seeker, I've asked him, I've asked them all. Sam, yeah. Timon, 
TP. I've questioned him as well. He can answer. Nobody can answer. Yeah, so this gets into and, and you're talking to a man who has no dog in this fight, right? Yeah. So oh, if no, I no, tell you, question. if I tell you, I want you to like take this you're and really look this up. Like I'm not a Christian at all. So I know what the Christians believe and I know what the text is saying, and I've been studying it. My friend, I know you're not gonna agree with me on this. Go to the gospel of John without a doubt. The best thing you could do is say that book is perverted. That's the best thing you could do because you have to really do gymnastics to get away from the fact that the gospel of John is trying to make him the logos. He is the eternal logos who preexisted was there. The creation of the world was made through him. This is the Jesus presented in John. It's not the Jesus mm -hmm. that's presented in Matthew. It's not mm -hmm. the Jesus that's presented in Luke or Mark, but this mm -hmm. John Jesus is yeah. a preexistent deity. Uh, he comes down there's a lot to unpack here. We I get that, and, and I get and I get that. And surprise, I think this is a bit unfair because we again, I don't have a dog in this fight either. <laughs> but I I know Islam, and I know you know Islam as well. So you're basically saying that this is an extrapolation of out of John's writing that if he's everywhere, he's always existed, then he can't be a normal human being, nor he can be a prophet because in Islam as well, prophet come. They come in the body, they, they're born and they die, they live their lives and they spread the message. This is Islamic context. Yeah. But a lot of things can be extrapolated and, and then people, and it can become a part of faith. Let me give you a clear example out of the Quran. What would you say? Where is God at the moment? Allah. Where is Allah? So is he on throne? Yeah, or, is he, or is he, hang on, let me finish my point because you'll get it. Or he's everywhere. Now you might give me one or the other or both answers. Mm -hmm. But you know this is a clear clash of beliefs, not just a peripheral, secondary, tertiary difference of opinion. It's a, it's a matter of belief between Salafis, or Ali Hadith, or yeah. Durbandis, one of the largest sects of Hanafi Islam. And so, so, so Ali Hadith say, you know, God is up there on the throne. He's not everywhere. But Ali, mm -hmm. but but Durbandi say that you no, know, God is. Allah is everywhere, not a dog. literally I everywhere. I, I, I know Job and he's dead. Do not believe he's everywhere. He dead. They do not believe he's everywhere. I if I showed you fatwa, what would you say? Yeah? This is this is one of the clear distinctions. They do believe that. If I showed I you do fatwa, do. I don't have it handy with me, but I can show you. It can I've I've shown it. I've actually made a video on that. I've actually shown the fatwa as well. There's not evidence of that, but in the in the Quran. So what do you believe? So what do you believe? Is God everywhere? Or in he's the, on on throne on top of uh, on his throne. In the Quran, yeah, you know the Ayat Kursi, the, the you know uh, chapter of the uh, chapter whatever yeah, you say. Know, yeah. He's he's above his throne. He's above his throne. He never says anything that he's everywhere. Nowhere will you find in Quran that he's everywhere. So do you? Never. So are you a Quranist then? So are you? No, are no, you categorically no, no, denying hadith, hadith as well? I follow. So you're so you're unbelievable. Okay, all right. So I'm gonna have to find. So maybe you can come to my show later on, and I'll show you references. There are plenty of references from various <laughs> imams as well. And there are very many schools of thought. But I get, anyway, my point is, my point is. So you're actually just taking the literal interpretation. But there are other schools of thought. If I showed you, there are other schools of thought. I don't know if someone is listening. Um, if, if they can, if they could find me that screenshot from from these books. Um, the, the, there's a fatwa on Durbandi. This is actually one of the major clashes between them. But anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll probably talk about it at some of the point because I think we're boring Derek. But anyway, so yeah, according to Derek, so yeah. if, if if in in John, if it says that God Jesus has been there forever, and it, then I'm before sorry, Abraham Jesus, was, I am. I mean, yeah, it's, yeah, that's that is God. That is a God. You can extrapolate out of that. No, it's but you can extrapolate clear. out. It's pretty clear. I mean, it's no. pretty clear in John's gospel. What you're looking at is is clearly, but strong. these are yeah, but these are these are these are not the words the words. They don't have to be, but they don't. Yeah, but I just gave you an example of God being everywhere and God just being on top of His throne. So, yeah. and, and a lot of Muslims will disagree with you as well. The whole point that so, so many different schools of thought is because people extrapolate different meanings from different verses. Anyway, I got to wrap it up. I got to go to the okay. next one. Thank you, Sir. Okay, brother. Yeah, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Okay. Um, okay, uh, Mr. Delicious, and then I'll take Friendly Muslim and Dali. I'm really sorry, guys. I oh, really... my oh. dude. 
What is, is that guy's seventh day? You, yes, seventh day. I'm not going to talk about it. I'm not going to talk what, about it. What What do you want, my friend? What do you want? I'm not. I'm not going to talk. Uh, I think uh, you and Harris have been uh, uh, have encountered the seven uh, seven day cycle argument, so I have to. I don't have to do it again. Uh, I just like to thank. Whoa, 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 whoa! What did we accept? What did you say? We have accepted it. What, what did no, you say? No, no. You have you have engaged with it. You have been. Oh, yeah, you yeah, have been. Yeah, you yeah, have yeah, encountered yeah. it already yeah. in the past. So I don't need yeah, to yeah. reestablish what has been established. Uh, yeah. I just uh, like to address, first of all, thank you very much for your objections against Christianity. Uh, it gives us the opportunity to see where you guys are coming from and right. uh, for us to be able to put our cards on the table to see what we're dealing with, especially when we're dealing with scholarship. Uh, I think, uh, uh, Derek, you've hosted uh, scholars, so-called scholars, mm -hmm. such as mm -hmm. uh, uh, Dr. Robert Price. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm telling people to exercise due diligence when these people are coming with information and anybody whoever claims to be a scholar or wh whoever is providing information to make sure because this information trickles down to the people and most people will not verify the information mm -hmm. so i'm just telling people to exercise due diligence i'm nobody but i'm the one who went on the canadian catholic show uh, show and challenged dr robert price on the meaning of the son of man which he said it was a universal term then i referred him to daniel 7 making it clear that the Aramaic word palat refers to uh, a worship of God. He was able, able to respond to that. I also addressed Dr. Kip to show me one example where the word to offer means to sacrifice, which he was unable to, to provide, but I could provide for Samuel chapter two, where it says that uh, Samuel was offered for temple service, the same Hebrew word. So again, another doctor who was challenged. And then I challenged also Dr. Joshua Bowen on slavery, uh, he quotes from Levit uh, Leviticus 25, verse 46 and 47. Then I say, why don't you quote 47 and 48 and uh, uh, verse 35, which undermines his whole claim to, of slavery. So these are the things a person like me who is a nobody, but who actually studied the scriptures can go against these so-called doctors and scholars mm -hmm. and show that they don't they don't know what they're talking about. That being said, I'll have one question to ask you. Uh, well, I have three things to to bring some clarification, and then I have a question to ask you. First thing, uh, are you aware that uh, that John eight, Jesus is referring to the uh, to the rabbis, so called rabbis, not the Jews, and this is something that was also shared by the Essenes, who believe that the rabbinic traditions or the priesthood was a false priesthood because it's not part of the Zadok priesthood. Because God says in uh, in Ezekiel forty five that He will put Zadok, the, the priesthood of Zadok as uh, his priesthood and not the uh, Levites. Uh, so so let's and, take and, this one thing at a time. You're saying okay. that you think this is not an anti-Jewish message. You you think that John 8, when it starts to talk about the Jews, you're yeah. saying this is only talking about specific leadership because you can go to the other Gospels and see Jesus rebuking other Jews, not that it's uh, anti-Jewish. Let, 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 me, let me bring some clarification. The reason why I could say that is uh, I could add also when G uh, the, uh, the rabbis came to him, are we blind? Because Jesus said that, the common people were blind. And he mm -hmm. says, no, uh, if you were blind, then you would uh, uh, have an excuse. But your sin remained. Why? Mm -hmm. Because you say you see. So every single time it was speaking about the uh, the leadership within Israel, not the Jews. And, and, and again, Jesus, Jesus was a Jew. Um, John was a Jew. So all his disciples were Jews. So it can't be anti-Semitic already there. It doesn't make any sense. But it's quite clear every single time he makes a rebuke, it's against the leadership of Israel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so I would, I would, for me, right, I would start to say, what is this literature? Do we honestly think this is a Jew writing the Gospel of John? Or is this possibly someone who's aware of Jewish teachings or is a Christian in a Greco-Roman context okay. that's responding to Judaism? Because Christianity breaks, a, it, it breaks off. What we see is it breaks off from Judaism. It It is not what we once saw. It's this new covenant that's coming in that's doing different things than maybe what we're seeing with the old covenant. And there's not a monolithic movement here, but this is why I go to the academics, because there are many scholars that I'm looking at the Greek, right? I'm not picking, I'm not picking a specific term and then you know trying to define what this term is. These people will read the language understanding other context of literature that's written around the same time. And they would say, this looks like Greek influence here. This looks like what the early church is actually already doing toward the Jews. So the ideas of the influence from non-Jews towards the Jewish people, because Jews are already kicking Christians, what we call Christians, out of the synagogues. 
So they're like, not only are they rejecting the message, they're not even letting Christians participate in the synagogues. I in guess. the 90s, in the 90s AD, we already have them saying like, you're not anymore a Jew. There were Jews literally telling other Jews, you're not a Jew anymore if you follow this Christ figure. So I, I think that, and, and I like the way you're taking this. It's an interesting approach to consider. But okay. I think that what the academics are saying, right, I'm looking at that going, that makes a lot of sense too, especially when we see influence of eat my flesh, drink my blood. Now, if you want to say Jews to taught that. that, yeah, if you think that that isn't a Eucharistic mystery cult practice no, or baptism not. isn't a mystery cult practice, I would recommend not only reading the Bible, but read outside contemporary mystery point. cult religions that are around there in that bubble of Greco-Roman period. And okay. you'll see that they baptized using water to initiate people into the cult. Because okay. remember, nobody knows who he is till they're in the group, till they're in Christ. And they get the mysteries of the Lord that are being revealed to them at this time. Um, that mystery aspect is in all of these different mystery cults. And then there was also the digesting, eating of the flesh and drinking of the blood of the God, which Osiris had the same thing. Uh, we saw this in Plutarch, which is written contemporaneous to the Gospels as well. So I would, I mean, you might be right about John. I, I admit, I, I, I'm not saying that I, I know that. Okay. Um, it's worth consideration, though. I like the way you're thinking. No problem. I, okay. I, I, guys, I, like uh, guys I really need to, I, I really quick, need to quick. make a move on. Real quick, real quick. I, I'm going to okay. address the Eurypress uh, if I get the chance. But just, uh, I, I showed you there's, there's a precedent they, it seems that the Dead Sea Scrolls, they were referring to the priesthood in Israel as being a false priesthood uh, because they were mm -hmm. not part of I the Zadok, Zadok priesthood. So again, this is not a Greek uh, uh, um, uh, disposition being enforced in the New Testament, but instead it was following following through with what the Essenes themselves believed. That's why they were in the caves because they believed the authority in Jerusalem was a false authority because they were not part of the Zadok priesthood. Now, as far as the Eucharist uh, thing go goes, do you know the very next verse in John 8 says, my words are spiritual? So mm -hmm. oh, yeah. right there, it, it, yeah, it, that, it makes it clear it's not a physical... Uh, no, uh, no, uh, the the, part, the active Eucharistic practice of eating, of eating a sacrament, eating of bread, he's not saying literally like okay. in the language he's saying, eat my flesh. It says actually okay. chew in Greek. It says chew my flesh. He's yeah. not saying, guys, cut my arm up and eat me. Okay. Okay. However, in this okay. practice, they would ritually practice the digestion, digestion of the God and the, the drinking of his blood in order to achieve sense. immortality in a spiritual in a sense. sense. Okay. But they literally weren't like just saying it. They, they would eat They'd have a ritual behind it. And okay. they really believed, though, that if you didn't do this spiritually, you wouldn't be yeah. immortal. I, so I it was you needed to practice this in order to have immortality. Anyway, last uh, Harris, like I'm, Harris. I'm, I'm, you, you did say last you, you did say last thing. Uh, look, look okay. please, maybe some. Thank you very much. No thank problem. you for coming. OK, so thank you very much. And I, I'm, I'm going to take friendly Salvatore Italian and then we're going to wrap this up. If there's any super chat, we'll probably address that. So Fraz, um, so, so we just spoke about, and you said that how in John, and this is such mm -hmm. a strong argument, and I'm like, whoa. And that just shows a little bit of uh, double standards, maybe, from Muslims' part. So, so far, I said that. Um, well, nowhere does it literally say in black and white that Jesus said that I'm God. And you right. said John, Gospels, John's Gospel, so-and-so places that, were, you know, he, Jesus always existed and always there. So that from yeah. that, they extrapolated that Jesus is God. I mean, dude, so they said, pick up stones right after he says, before Abraham was, I am. They pick up stones. The Jews pick up stones and they say, blasphemy. You're a man claiming to be equal with God. Like you claim right. to be God. Why are you ready to stone the guy? If uh, they didn't understand what he was saying, yeah. you know, it's yeah. pretty clear that the but, text is trying to say something there. So. Exactly. So, but then I said, well, there's a double standard here because in Islam, we do the same thing as well. I just thought of one example, but I didn't have the reference, but people have sent me that. The God, the, and, and they're very sex. God doesn't literally say exactly. And, and people are allowed to extrapolate things, interpret scriptures the way they see fit. And that, right. in my opinion, that is a weakness of the scripture that, you know, you have to interpret so many ways. And then we have divisions and then yeah. wars and people can't agree on anything. It's because the original source is pretty weak. And, you can't you, you if you hold the bible to, uh, on, on to the standard that it has to be written black and white otherwise well, i'm not going to take it and but we know why you're taking that because it doesn't suit your narrative jesus mm -hmm. 
Jesus can't be God. He was just a messenger. That's the Islamic worldview. And then you put that. So have a look at this one. So we shared, I said, in, in Islamic scripture and various sects of Islam, there's a major disagreement whether God is everywhere or God is above his throne. So have a look at this first fatwa. This question has been asked, and this has troubled a lot of people. Is God everywhere? Some people believe that God is everywhere. So the fatwa is that this view has implications, and that's probably the reason why they don't want to admit that God is everywhere. Uh, that God, This view, that God is everywhere, has implications are very false. Because if you say that Allah is everywhere, this implies that he's in the bathrooms and toilets and maybe in poops and Allah forbid. In, and in other places that are filled with impurities and filth and who would describe his Lord in such terms. So that's one of the reasons. But hang on, this is one, one worldview and this is Salafis. Let me ask you a question, Derek. Now let me show you the Quran and let me ask you, what do you imply from that? Can Are you allowed to interpret it any which way or whatever, wherever your common sense takes you? So have a look at this one. This is chapter 57 verse 4 he says he's the one who created the heavens and earth in six days ignore that bad scientific claim then he positioned himself on the throne then he positioned himself on the throne right so he knows whatever goes into the earth and whatever comes out of it out from it and whatever descends from the sky and whatever ascends there to he is with you wherever you are and allah is watchful of whatever you do. So what do you imply? And are you allowed to get confused? Hang on, is he then he positioned himself on the throne? And there are other places as well where he says Allah, uh, Allah's throne is above water and that's where he was. And then he came down and created the heaven, this one. And are you allowed to to get confused that hang on, he's saying he's everywhere and then he's saying he's on throne on, on his throne? Are you well, allowed? I mean well, just by reading anyone's that. allowed to do whatever they want, I guess. And you know, I guess well, would you be justified if you, if you get confused. Yeah, I think uh, positioned himself on the throne then he's everywhere you are uh, sounds you could interpret this throne right someone mm -hmm. might interpret the throne to be like kind of a kind of like a, a a title for what he's like he is ruling that's the whole point he's just ruling which means yeah. it's a statement of saying i'm everywhere and i'm ruling from a throne yeah. however if you go into the ancient near east this is a question I've had as I entered into Muslim uh, material. In the ancient Near East, gods really, they believed, were really sitting on thrones. And they were surrounded by many gods, their council, council of other gods. And so I'm thinking to myself, is Arabia possibly one of these untouched areas that wasn't impacted by Hellenism in in the Hellenistic world, that they kind of had primitive models of ancient Near Eastern thinking, and we're finding remnants of it by Allah sitting on a throne, and they really think a throne. I don't know. It makes me have, you know, this might be why there's a debate between Muslims on this topic. Hmm. Others are more philosophical minded, and they're saying, we're not going to have him literally sitting on a throne. Uh, others are saying, no, he's literally on a throne somewhere. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> let me show, Let me show you another verse. Okay. Now, this is chapter 50, verse 16, and that one says, Indeed, we have created man, and we know whatever thoughts his inner self develops, and we are closer to him than his jugular vein. Mm -hmm. And this is a very common verse. This is why I was shocked that he said that, no, 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 there are, Allah is only one place above his throne. So so the, the previous caller that we had, Safras, he was saying that, you know, no, no, Allah is not everywhere. And... And I and I said that there, there, there are a lot of sects within Islam that actually believe Allah is everywhere. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. I'm not taking a position where he is, whether he's above his throne or he's everywhere. I'm not taking that position. But I'm just saying there is a confusion. But you have you set a standard that it has to be written in black and white. Only then Je I would accept that Jesus is son of God or Jesus is the God or um, according to the gospel of John. So, so that's just a double standard because your own. You, if you apply the same standard to the Quran, I'm sorry, it's not going to work. That, that that was the only point that I was trying to make. Uh, I, uh, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, so I think just, that that's an interesting point. Even with our last caller, your way or the Yahweh or whatever his name is uh, that comes on, uh, um, you know, there are interpretations he's taking. I would say talk to John J. Collins, who's written for 40 years on on Daniel. Uh, talking about the Son of Man, what's going on in the New Testament versus what we find in Daniel, various things. There's interpretations and in how, like, this is the point. All of this debate, all of this argument over what this text means, what this happens, what to say, and it's like, it's all up for us to try and figure it out and interpret what it means. Why it would be much easier if God just 
you know, made it very clear and actually showed everybody instead of having this debate where we're wrestling over texts that are up for interpretation. They're not right. solid evidence. They're not really, you know, there. And by the way, you're going to go to hell if you get it wrong. Really? <laughs> you know? Yeah. All right. Well, with the, yeah, we, now we go into the atheistic domain, which uh, they they don't want to come from that. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Salvador Dali, and then I'm going to take friendly Muslim. That would be the last one. I'm Hi. really, really sorry. I think we might push you to Salvador Dali. Just, just one question, yeah. please. Yeah, yeah. Hit me I, in I the head. One question. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Derek. Hey, Harry. Hey, what's up, uh, so, Derek, my question is on, on myths. You, you yeah. think there's a way some people's brain is wired that they believe in myths? Like, when mm. I read these texts, they're so, like, so archaic. They're so, I would say, backwards in the way they're telling you, okay, what the world is, what the world should be. And then this thinking goes all the way and has, like, right now, you know, all these um, vax deniers, you know, in America right mm -hmm. now, in the U.S., where we live. I guess like there are fifty percent, like forty percent people have not like taken vaccines. It goes to the same for um, for stem cell, this Roe versus Wade. So you think that thinking already has real term consequences? Number one, and number two, you how why don't you why don't we just go out and attack it fully rather than um, being nice? Because okay, well I think he's already like, answered nice, that part. I think he's already an answered that part. Yeah. I think he's already answered that part. So let's just focus on the first part. And um, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So, okay. yeah. I, I do right. want to say I'll... that I, I do attack it fully. I'm just not yeah. aggressive in, in, as, in, as maybe, I mean, maybe, maybe I'm, as me I, or. Right. I'm aggressive in terms of giving you the insight. Now, the first question, um, yeah. I, I was kind of having a hard time. Was it, are we hardwired for mythology? Yeah. I think so. I mean, how often, without any stories, let me give you an example. You ever told a story about yourself achieving something and you kind of wanted to embellish it a little bit. You enhanced it a bit. You made it sound like you really beat that guy up more than, you know, when he was fighting you, you, you won that. Fight. <laughs> I'm saying though, like, like you might even think more about the, the, the memory of what you did, your memory, you make mm -hmm. your memory more than what it was when you tell the story to someone else. That is Fair the enough. beginning of myth making. It is the that is it is hardwired into us as social creatures to invent and create narratives that we know are going to socially advance us in some sense. I mean, will I get the prettiest girl in the room if I just tell her I lifted 100 pounds? Or what if I told her I put 350 pounds on there and I repped it 10 times while the big boys around me couldn't even do it once? And then have the big boys say, I saw it with my own eyes. She might look at me differently. We create stories. We love stories. And we this lie, is what though. we lie. Yes, we lie. And we love them. We love them. So what, what, so what would, no, but what would you say about the girl who sees this? And then she says, she's, she thinks a bit like me. She says, she can smell the bullshit out of that. Right. And, 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 and that's the kind of girl I would want to be. So, uh, <laughs> whereas these religious people want to say, Oh, he said that he lifted 350 pounds. The big guy said it. Therefore, it must be true. Right. So, right, right. so I understand the importance of the myth making and, and how we make stories. But th this is as us skeptics. Yeah. We're trying to tell the world that, hang on. Yeah, we all do it to some extent. I, hey, I've mm -hmm. said it. I've, I've lied in my personal life. And I think yeah. everyone has lied to some extent. Yeah. But we're trying to tell you that, you know, people lie. So you should be able to see through it. I, th I think so. So I get your point that we do create that. But. But we need that in us to be able to differentiate between the fact and the fiction. Right, right. I right. agree with you. Um, right. Yeah, I'd say to that girl, uh, well done on having skeptical, you know, being able to be skeptical of what people tell yeah. you. It's a yeah. good practice to not believe everything people say, but it's still funny. You, even when you go to a stand-up comedian, they're going to exaggerate yeah. something and oh, you're going to yeah. laugh. You may yeah. not even believe what they're saying is true, but it's funny. It's It's entertaining. And I think a lot of right. these stories are written to be entertaining too. When you read it in right. the Bible, or if you read it elsewhere, you can, I can't imagine that whoever wrote the book of Jonah wasn't trying to be funny. It's, oh, it's, yeah. it's super funny. He gets called by God to go to the enemies of Israel to preach repentance. He runs. He's like, Oh hell no. And he's <laughs> running. He gets on a boat and he tries to run away. And then a big fish swallows him and spits yeah. him up on the shore. He's like, you're going to do what I told you, buddy. And whoever wrote this is, is just funny. Okay. But um, I do think that some, but I do think that 
he they did write it with the intention that someone is going to literally buy it. Well, yeah, that's kind of the part. In fact, there's a story of so they're uh, fooling, they're liars. Then yes, I know the story. Yes, everybody's alive. Yeah, but but we have given them the status, the ultimate status of our heroes and our, you know, right, and right, right. Beal. You know, you know, th that's what's frustrating. You know, I used to think I, my I can't, dad I'm not was willing to give them any credit though. Like, I mean, I'm not willing to see them as something special or you know, like you did well because I, I see its effects that it's fooled generations of humans. I mean, I'll just use one example. I used to think my dad was invincible. Growing up as a child, I said, no one could ever beat him. He's the strongest, best. Str like, there's just nobody could ever beat my dad. And he has, like, a special forces army soldier, you know, ego. So he really put on I am Hercules type of mentality. I believed it. It was finally one day when it dawned on me, dad is a human like me. And he, he's you know, old. Like, he's getting older. Yeah. And he can't do what he used to do and things like that. Like, you're shocked to reality. Because you you make them your hero. We all want a hero. We all want these things, but the religions have. I need another hero. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but religions have really capitalized yeah. on things that are that really do cause people harm, and yeah. take that hero thing to the next level. Uh, there's a lot of things that you can get yeah. into, but. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, uh, I I know friendly Muslim. I told you, but I didn't expect this one. My. My friend Ghali Kamal has come. I don't know if you know about him. So he 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 is a uh, he's an ex Christian Pakistani. And, oh, awesome! Uh, and uh, and and hence he has to wear a mask. He's not in right. Pakistan at the moment, uh, but yeah, he's he's my he's my friend and he's my partner in crime when we, when it comes to taking the discourse forward in the Indian and Pakistani spectrum. Right. The the guy is right there. Some people say you know like he he he. A lot of people, anyway. So, ex Christian, very knowledgeable, and I'm just going to shut up, and I'm uh, I'm, I'm going to leave you two to actually ask each other whatever you want to, whatever you, Ghalib, you want to ask. But but just bear that in mind, Ghalib. I've only got 20 minutes left, and I have promised friendly Muslims yeah, yeah. been sitting there for. I'll, I I have just a few short questions, and I like to tell him a few things. Pakistani Christians are a very small minority, maybe two percent, but there are a few who have now become atheists because of what Harris and I are doing. Wow. So it's it's not most of the times we are not even Chris, criticizing Christianity, but they do change because of that. Even when because they learn the total, uh, you know, the overall rational narrative, so they change. And many mm -hmm. people have. Uh, I do criticize Christianity most of the times, but people don't. You, you have to be a Christian to understand that I'm not criticizing Islam at that moment. I'm criticizing Christianity. Mm -hmm. So. Sometimes they do, but I, you know, you did a stream with uh, Dr. Barterman, and I am a really huge fan of him. But uh, he has written about the history of Gospels, and uh, but I think he seems undecided about a few things. But you know, I just want to ask you this one. Uh, I don't know what your opinion is. Do you think that there was a original Aramaic source to the Gospels or not? No. No, Greek, Greek. I don't think there was an Aramaic. I think Papias is off. Oh, he says Hebrew actually. It wasn't even Aramaic. So I think they're originally Greek. And the reason so, why is all the experts, the, huh? What about the few phrases that are there in the New Testament, like Eli, Eli, Lama, Shab, Shab, Katani? That those. Do you think that still those things are do not refer to any kind of? Uh, I don't think Aramaic. that means there's an original source that was Aramaic, just like Aramaic. I wouldn't say that Mark was originally written in Latin because, well, there are Latin loan words in the Greek. Um, that doesn't that could just simply mean we live in a Greco-Roman world where there is syncretism of language and loan words are being borrowed from Aramaic, Latin, Greek, you name it. And they're all kind of sharing similar language. Hebrew might even come up. So um, the academics I talk to, you know, that I would look to and go, okay, they know this Greek. They've not seen in the Greek any evidence that they're translating from other languages to write these books in Greek. And the closest one that I know of that anyone would in be in agreement on is the book of Revelation. It looks like whoever wrote that isn't their first language isn't Greek. Their first language is probably Aramaic. They probably mm -hmm. don't really speak Greek. 
or read Greek as their primary. So they're 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 writing and it's kind of choppy and sloppy Greek in the book of Revelation. Do you even think that Gospel of Mark, maybe the first one, was even written in the in the uh, present day Israel or not? I don't know. This is a debate. Uh, Dr. James Tabor thinks that it could be somewhere up north. Others think that Mark probably was written in Rome. Uh, don't really know the answer to that question. It's like saying, when do you think this is dated? We can't prove like... There's implications to give us internal reasons to think maybe this, maybe that. Nothing is in stone. And that's the problem with this literature is like we can't be certain of anything, of any of these, you know, claims. And do you think that Paul had access to Mark or maybe did he I, access to Mark? Or, no, no. You know, no. I think Paul's before the Gospels. Before the Gospels. Yeah. And then when they say that Luke was written by a disciple of Paul. So does that even stand up or not? No, I don't think that stands up because Luke and Acts, I, for reasons that I on my show do, that Luke and Acts are late. I see Luke and Acts as being written much later, possibly second century. So here you have a disciple of Paul that's, you know, Paul's writing in the 50s, supposedly writing much later. I think that Luke and Acts are late, late books. And, and there's a whole show, if you go on my channel and watch the one I did with um, with um, Steve Mason on how we know the book of Acts is written like later. In Acts, they're aware of writing that is in Josephus' works, Antiquities, and War of the Jews, I'm sorry. And that book, is it was published in 93 AD. So how is it that Acts knows of Josephus' works See, Christians will make, well, how do you know that the that Josephus didn't borrow it from Luke? Like, that's kind of nonsense because you can read and look at the arguments and you'll say there'd be no reason for that. So and at what least about, after 93. And now it's come to Josephus. So do you think that what he wrote about Jesus, he wrote it or it was a later fabrication? You talking about in Josephus? Yeah, Josephus. So here we are again with like a big question mark. Is the one in Josephus Antiquities 18, the one that they call the Testimonium Flavianum, is there something uh, to it? There might yeah. have been something originally there. I do not find that. I think that it has been embellished, at least by Eusebius. I think that Eusebius... But Dr. Bartleman that, says that it is original in one of his not, books. Not that whole passage. So Bart Ehrman thinks it's partially interpolated, like someone fudged it. That originally it probably said something basic about this guy, Jesus, who died at the hands of Pontius Pilate, who might have been like an apocalyptic uh, prophet or something. And that's it. Like it's some really basic thing. But it became interpolated later. So Bart thinks, I think, it's partially interpolated. The other passage in Antiquities 20, where it talks about James, the brother of Jesus, uh -huh. who was called the Christ, um, that's a harder one because most scholars think yeah, that's that authentic. Is the one, that is the one who, to which Dr. Barterman refers. Yeah, because he says James existed, Peter existed. That means someone like Jesus must have also existed. Right. But the the whole facade, this, this Jesus, son of God, and yeah. that's all what he says is fiction. But you know, yeah. his recent book, Christians have been using it a lot. Which one? Heaven and Hell or? Oh, the last one, this recent. Uh, I'm just forgetting its name. I've read it. <laughs> the last one, the, the recent one, in which he says that Jesus probably existed. But okay. now the Christians are using the only, those parts where he says that Jesus might have existed. Right. But uh, in the book, he clearly says that uh, that. Uh, uh, what Jesus we see in the Gospels, that Jesus did not exist. Yeah, yeah But the yeah. Christians are using it now. <laughs> yeah, Jesus is the last anything. goddess? What? Is that, I, Jesus, is that, is that Jesus, uh, Jesus and the last goddess? Is that the book you're talking about? No, 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 no. That's it's the God. one Sorry. on it. He wrote one book specifically on the historical Jesus, but yeah, it yeah, wasn't yeah, the latest. The, the latest he did was Heaven and Hell, and he's writing one yeah, right now on yeah, Revelation. I'm, I'm wrong here. I'm wrong here. But it's wrong okay. It's, yeah, no, I get what you're saying. And yeah, so I noticed lots of Christians will use Bart Ehrman when it's against mythicists, people who think Jesus didn't exist. Yeah, yeah. They love yeah. to use him because, well, 
He's an atheist. And he says, no, there yeah. was definitely a Jesus. <laughs> um, David Wood loves to do that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, guys, so, I think I think you sorry, Khalib, I, yes, I, 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 I really have to... one last one. One last one. So do you think that uh, uh, that Christianity as a religion has more to do with Rome than Judea? In the end, I think, yeah, I think in the end, yeah, okay. when it's become a political, uh, you know, when it became the legal religion, I think absolutely. Um, even out the gate, this is the problem. This is the problem. We, I think we have the wrong idea of understanding what was really going on in Judaism. We think there's Jews and then there's the outside world and they had a bubble force field protecting them from the ideas of the outside world. At this time, Hellenism from, from Alexander the Great onward literally permeated every type of culture, every type of religious group to the point where they pretty much sweat Hellenism. They sweat out these ideas. So when we talk about Judaism, and I have my friends like Rabbi Toby Seeger come on to try and attack Christianity, and he goes, oh, Paul's a liar, and he twisted things. Dude, the rabbis twisted things. Like you find out that there's an impact that's going on more than just the Jewish world. There is a lot of Greco-Roman influence, and that's that's what I would say. We are just now starting to realize more and more how much impact the Greco-Roman world is having. So as far as this particular region, this location in Judea, yeah, Christianity, it's it's much bigger than that now. Right. Yeah. Okay. Guys, um, I, I know I know probably a lot of you, I, I think this is going to be, I mean, already the kind of questions, the way you articulated and the way you went with them, that already makes it for very interesting viewing. So why don't you guys actually, you know, you can yeah. go to his uh, channel. I'd and love that'd to be have awesome. him over to my channel. You know, Derek, you be, you yeah. would be you you would be impressed by this man's knowledge. I mean, to me, like this guy is a he's a powerhouse. Like, I mean, the way I mean, fair enough. You know, like I mean, I blaspheme and I think you know he's I'm I'm his equal. But you know what he just talked about all the books that he's read. I'm like, I have no idea what he's talking about. So yeah, yeah. You know, I think you guys should clap. But I because he's from um, the Christian background and he's uh, he's an atheist. Uh, but if you but if you don't like my temperament and you think that you know I'm a bit too hawkish, then well, we, he might be a bit too <laughs> more than that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, thank you very much for coming, Khalid. Okay, okay, thank um, you, thank, thank you, Alex. you, thanks for having um, me. Okay, okay. Derek, I'll get in touch with you. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. So email me. Uh, yeah. Yeah. All right, so that was Galib, and we've got one last question for Friendly Muslim. Friendly, I know you've been waiting, otherwise I would have I would have ditched you, but uh, you've been oh, waiting for a while. Oh, it's this guy so again? Just, yeah, yeah, it's my, yeah, the, <laughs> my favorite combination of atheists, sweet and sour. Everybody likes sweet and sour. Uh, so you're calling me the sweet one, right? No. He's not that sour. <laughs> <laughs> Derek tells me he loves me the way I am, and I don't need to change, so that that's fine. Okay. Um, I was talking about triune gods. So in your evaluation of these uh, different types of gods, how many triune gods up until the point of Jesus and the uh, start of the right of the Gospels were in play at the time? I or don't previously? know. I don't know of any triune gods. I know of uh, what you could say three powers kind of stuff. I know that in Hinduism they have three powers. I know that in Judaism they had like a... a to God type thing. So there's already like a, a, a what do you call that? Uh, when it, there's Yahweh and then Yahweh's spirit. There's There seemed to be almost like a dual thing going on in the Hebrew Bible in certain places. But as Would far Rabbi as... Would Rabbi Tovia agree with that position? I don't know. I don't know if he does. Orthodox Judaism, I'm not sure if they do. Um, but it is an interesting note. I think that Michael Heiser, one of the Christian apologist scholars wants to point that out and show like, Hey, they had a dual concept of Yahweh and they still said the God is one. So it's, it's really kind of, he'll say hypocritical of Jews who are saying in the scripture, here's two and one. And yet, uh, you know, you, you think it's contradictory, you know, and doesn't make any sense. This, this is something new, by the way, I learned. I, I, I had no idea. I, I taught, uh, friendly Muslim. I don't know if it would, well, you probably knew this because um, talk about triune gods. Um, I, 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 I didn't know. I thought I thought it was only the Christians who 
who smuggled in this, you know, this trinity, and then obviously this father and son kind of relationship. I, I, I thought Jews were just as dogmatic about monotheism as we were, or yeah. Muslims were. I think that's why you ended up with this hybrid, strange doctrine we call the Trinity, because they're they're trying to keep monotheism or this Shema, the Lord our God is one. They, they want that to be a core doctrine of Christianity, but they simultaneously want to have different people as part of roles of the divine. And that's where you jacked up. Like it's all it's all mixed up because now you have a doctrine that is Jewish in nature. The Lord our God is one. It's not just Jewish, by the way. I mentioned this earlier in Herodotus. Mm -hmm. They believe there's only one God. The people who are shooting arrows at the sky and whatnot. Salmoxus is the God. But um, it's like really a Jewish thing. And I think that's where the Christians get the idea from is one God. But then they simultaneously have to explain how Jesus is divine and has a father who is God. And explaining this issue when the, the Christology developed over the next few centuries they, they're like, okay, we're going to keep the Lord our God as one and yet still try to make sure Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit are one, which is when you end up getting the Trinity. But it's not all Christians that think in that way either. Christianity was the wild, wild west for a few centuries, especially into the second century. We just really mainly have preserved literature best by church fathers. The winners write history. And it's rare that we get any of the literature of the people who opposed the church. The heretics, they call them. So, yeah, as far as that goes, I don't think there was ever a Trinity concept of three being one anywhere. I think it's when you have this Shema, our Lord, our God is one, and then you're trying to fit multiple deities and concepts of deities into this package, if that makes sense. But 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 this is probably one of the reasons that why us, or even Muslims, or people who are ex-Muslims and atheists, and we just can't, grasp our heads around this trinity and being one and then being three at the same time it just doesn't make any sense to us and then christians tell us no you don't understand which is fair enough we don't understand <laughs> so, well, i don't know friendly has that ever bothered you because i know this issue of tawhid is so central to the doctrine of islam and by the way it's not exclusive to islam it's zoroastrian what was it ahura mazda Egyptian going to Aten, was it? Um, so, so these ideas have been yeah. floated before. Um, the, it, friendly Muslim, do you have any anything else yeah. to add? To I, that? I mean, so the, the the argument, I mean, from the Muslim perspective, is is always the who is Jesus praying to, and why is Jesus calling out to himself if mm -hmm. it is a triune natured God, and that would be our polemist arguments essentially. Um, so that's always been the case, and then we mm -hmm. get God is a mystery. Which, which I had from a, a lovely Christian on the weekend telling me he loved me very much until I argued about the Trinity um, and, and the narratives and history. And then he so told he hated me, you well, by we'll, the end of it. Yeah, no, he said, we'll see you on Judgment Day. I said, see, <laughs> that's how you love, this is, this is this Christian yeah. love day that we've come accustomed to. I can only invite you to Islam. I can't tell you you're gonna burn in hell, but okay, that's fine, I, I got it. Um, and in terms of Sons of God and, and Honey the Circle Maker, um, I read a beautiful poem that um, it was if he was asking his God, uh, the father for for uh, he was playing with his father and asking for the weather to change, and uh, so he was always considered a son of God. So this tradition of in Judaism of calling God the Father wasn't abstract or just something new because of Jesus. I think it became more concreted because they they elevated this son of God uh, perception and, and father and son. I, I friendly Muslim, but I, I actually, to me, like I started thinking about that point as well, the Quranic verse. But there's one more point in that, that is that it's actually specifically talking about Ezra, though. Like, I mean, if you're trying to go to the angle of uh, towards, you know, defending that verse and saying that, hey, you atheists make fun of us that the Jews don't believe in that, but that's specifically for Ezra, though. But anyway, I'll let. Uh, yeah, I haven't looked into the no. Ezra, uh, the specific Ezra claim that is going on with this debate between Christians and Muslims on Muslims, that topic. Yeah. yeah, but as far as the Son of God thing, it is prevalent. It is something that is is common. So, David was a son of God. Okay, um, yeah? like according to Jewish literature, yes. But here's the thing: it that this whole getting from the Greco-Roman context and seeing what's going on with sons of God. That's something worth considering. You can't imagine these people lived in a bubble and we know sons of God. And what did they do? They claim to be descendants from divine. 
They claim to be the descendants of divine uh, figures. This is what we see in the Greco-Roman world. Augustus Caesar, I was bringing up earlier, claimed to be a descendant of uh, Romulus, who was the founder of Rome. And Romulus claimed to be a descendant directly from Venus. Uh, but there's also this idea that he is a son of an actual divine uh, figure having his mother get pregnant and, and birthing him. So he's actually a direct son of God. And you kind of wonder what the genealogies of Jesus are doing in the Gospels. What are they trying to do? They're trying to make the lineage come through Joseph, which isn't even his actual father. But they're making her a virgin, and she's conceived by God, by the Holy Spirit. So there's no actual sex between Mary and Joseph, but God births Jesus. So he is an actual son of God, according to the New Testament Gospels. And all you have to do is look in the Greco-Roman context, and you'll see it. So what is meant by son of God is a real good question to ask. What is it meant? Does it mean that they're claiming to be a descendant of the actual divine in some sense? Or are they just saying, I'm a child who believes, I, I'm a child of this God. I believe in this God and this God adopted me. There's there's a lot of context here, but I know that Islam says no to the whole son of God thing. Yeah. And you, you there's probably reasons why they've taken that sharp stance. And I wonder if it's due to the cultural historical context of different Christologies that are happening at the time that Muhammad and the Quran are being written. Are they are they adjusting their doctrine based on the teachings of other Christians that are going on around? Because there were Christians who were literally saying God died on the cross, not that Jesus mm. died. They believed that Jesus was God and that God died on the cross. So some of the academics I've talked to say Islam is a reaction to correct all the bad theology around by Christians. Well, Muslims saying, claim that too. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they well, don't they say also to the yes. polytheism? I mean, no, no, no. The, uh, it, it, it's uh, well, poly, polytheism is totally wrong, right? But all these um, this pollution of scripture and beliefs that occurred due to the due to Jews and Christians that uh, Muhammad came to correct all of that. That's the central right. claim, um, and. Um, but it's interesting that you said that Christians use God and Jesus synonymously, as Amber Heard uses pledge and donation synonymously. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, yeah. um, friendly Muslim, I um, we've got to wrap this up. I think it's very interesting. Um, I, I, with, I, 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 there's so much more to ask. I love this. And, and I honestly loved you two as a combination, and I would urge you to do this again. I, I like uh, uh, Harris's approach to history also, so... Um, uh, I would look forward to you both combining as a, a beautiful dish of sweet and sour again that we can delight over. Well, I, and I really have an well, obsession for duck right now after Derek's <laughs> duck preferences. Yeah, a, a lot of a, a lot of uh, quacky ducks today. But um, uh, with, with Derek though, like I mean, I, I this is so much. A lot of this, like I've never heard of it. But and and I'm like I'm just, I feel like awfully ignorant. Uh, but I think it was very interesting and educational. And I'll try to you know, um, put it in the bank. Um, but, uh, but one thing, Derek, I'd really encourage you is to have a conversation with a guy who came with the mask, Khalid Kamal. I think, I think that's going to make for a very interesting conversation. Yeah. Um, and, and you guys are just going to get it on and, you know, like you, you, the, 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 there's so much, so much to talk about. Um, because I was initially when, when, when I was just speaking with you before the call is, I was just constantly, and I know what's the word for people who seek patterns. Um, so, so I, I was just looking at similarities and differences. I would, I would just look, and I was mesmerized by that. How, how there's so many similarities between religious people, and how the differences in mm -hmm. the in the theology, uh, but they're not. The, but but human behavior is always the same. There's there's protectionism over it. There's like, def, the, the, there's defensiveness that how we're going to defend it. Tribalism is like. No, no, no. My one is yeah. the right one. But yeah. when you look at it, 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 it's all marred in mystery and mythicism. So that's why we had myth vision. <laughs> yeah, I just I, I still appreciate the stories like I read Greco-Roman mythology. And I hope and I look, I've been asked, what do you think is going to happen in Christianity in a thousand years? Yeah. I think and I don't know this to be a fact, but on the path we're taking with science and advancing and stuff. I think we'll look at Christianity like we look at Greek mythology and other things. When I read these sources, other than Christian sources, go to Suetonius, go to Plutarch, go to various Greco-Roman authors. 
you'll be shocked to find how common the idea of a birth, a special birth that was going to be foretold or prophesied, and that a god with a woman made the child, ended up making this divine birth. The idea that they want to kill the newborn children because there's this omen or this prophecy that a noble ruler of the people is going to come. And sure enough, it's Caesar Augustus, right? And you're like, whoa, hold on, what? This is in Matthew. Why is this in Suetonius? Mm -hmm. It's all over the world. Why is this one true and those are not? And I really wish people would be more open-minded. Right. Well, thank you very much, friendly Muslim. And on this note, we'll wrap this up. And I'm going to say that uh, I'm, I'm, the more I speak with people from different religious backgrounds, the more I realize uh, when it comes to defending the faith, they're all the same. Uh, we've got one new comment that I just looked at. It Give me proof that you can't be born twice. And this is obviously coming from, I think, Hindu perspective <laughs> with the reincarnation. It's the same way. Give me proof that uh, you know Allah doesn't exist, or give me proof that Jesus wasn't the Son of God, or give me proof that Muhammad wasn't the final messenger of Allah. So the the, yeah. the, the faulty basis, unfalsifiable claims. That's why they can't be believed. But thank you very much, Derek. I, I really appreciate that. I really enjoy this conversation. And um, and and, I, and I'm gonna go down your way. I'm gonna start speaking and inviting other people because I'm kind of getting bored of listening to my own voice. So I think it's probably a better <laughs> good idea if I if I start you know <laughs> stop speaking and start listening a bit more. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, man. I hope the, the journey is well. There's so much out there to explore. And mm. if you need anything, you know, you can always let me know. Absolutely. All right, guys, this is it. We'll join you on Sunday as per my normal Sunday scoop with Nuria, with Khan and Sultan. Until then, ta-da, bye-bye.